Rowan, a man at age 25, abruptly died and reincarnated into the world of One Piece. The problem is the fact that that's it. No cheat, no system, no special power whatsoever. Even worse, the only thing he knows about One Piece is the appearance of the protagonist. But hey, at least I'm in this peaceful village. If I stay low-key, I'll be fine. Rowan thought to himself as he enjoyed the nice weather of Kokuyasi village. And there's literally a marine base in our village. What can go wrong? Answer, everything. How will Rowan struggle for his survival? Read to find out more. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in One Piece? Starting at Kokuyasi Village, Part 1. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Life surely is unpredictable, isn't it? Rowan, a 25-year-old man, he was simply living his everyday life. Due to how everything recently got busy for him, Rowan didn't have as much time to invest in his favorite hobby, watching anime. However, the Christmas season came, and Rowan was finally granted with a break he wanted. What was the first thing that he did? Well, watching anime was important, but so were the others. Rowan first called his friends and families asking how they have been doing, wishing them the Merry Christmas, etc. Afterward, he had a deep sleep in his cozy room. After the Christmas has passed, and the break was about to be over, Rowan was finally seen to be watching the anime, Demon Slayer in particular. With the earphones attached onto his ears, and his eyes locked onto the medium-sized screen in front of him. Come on, Tanjiro, you got this! Rowan gritted his teeth in anger as he watched how the main character, has been facing a tough situation ahead of him. Save your sister? Come on. Show some protagonist energy. Total concentration breathing, hell yeah. Then all of a sudden, his whole sight overturned. The features from his room, such as the chair he was sitting on, the monitor he was staring at, the table it lied upon, everything has blended into a hollow white. What? Rowan subconsciously muttered out in a confusion. The phenomenon that he was experiencing was simply too abnormal for him to maintain his calmness. You died. Suddenly, a voice boomed from his back, slowly turning to the source with a slight anxiousness. Rowan was greeted with a glowing white orb, which had a human-like mouth as the only noticeable feature. Died. Rowan couldn't understand how he died. Wasn't he simply in his room? What could possibly be the cause of his death? I don't understand how the white orb's mouth turned into a frown, why should I explain myself? All that matters is that you died. Period. Rowan bit his lips in frustration. This got to be a prank, right? How can I die just like this? How would my family react? The white orb clearly seemed to be uninterested in Rowan's distress. Growing a white-colored arm from its side, it passed a cubic dice to Rowan. It... It isn't funny, you know. Grabbing onto the dice that floated in front of him, Rowan whispered in disbelief. Roll this dice... The white orb simply stated in a monotone. Rowan inspected the dice given to him. Out of the six faces, five were labeled with the word reincarnate, while the last face was labeled with the word transmigrate. Rowan already had a good idea what the purpose of this dice was, but he still felt numb from his apparent death. Nonetheless, Rowan threw the dice up in the air, complying to the white orb, whom Rowan believed to be something akin to a god. Transmigrate as the only possible option kind of like Konosuba, granted a special power of your choice. Rowan thought in intrigue as the dice spun up in the air. Yes it is, but... The white orb somehow answered to Rowan's thought, and the dice landed on the ground before bouncing back up, not for you it seems. The dice finally landed without any motion, with the face indicating reincarnate on top. Underneath the word, a straw hat was drawn. Rowan's eyes narrowed upon sighting the drawing, which wasn't present before he threw the dice. Straw hat? One piece. Out of all possibilities, 
What's the chance of being reincarnated into the anime world, which he never even thought to have existed in reality? Yes, yes, the white orb said tiredly and snapped with his fingers. Go. Enjoy your new life. Have fun or whatever. Bye. Hold on dash before Rowan could finish his words. He was gone with a popping sound. Now alone in the white space. The white orb sighed in exhaustion. Ah, that dude just now was a 976, 348, 275, 294, 284, 283, 584, 362, 432, 438, 492, 532, 593, 294, 538, 294, 542, 211, 104, 328, 555, 382, 494, 275 individual. Please God, why torture me in a space like this? Pure boredom and endless repetition. Why even create me with capability to feel emotion? Wait. The white orb halted its pestering, and its mouth curled up to a smile in a sudden realization. Oops. It seems that I forgot to erase that guy's memory just now. Haha <laughs> yes, purely accidental. I'm so totally screwed. This is going to be in not interesting at all. Hell yeah, first was all white, and now it's pitch black. How cool. Having experienced the series of abnormal phenomena, Rowan ceased to think. Now where am I? Rowan tried to look around, but found himself unable to do so. Wait! My body is dashed suddenly. He felt the tightening sensation all around him, causing him to cry out in pain. Ow. What the hell? Don't tell me that I actually reincarnated. Rowan thought to himself, and simultaneously, an unconscious cry came out from his mouth. Wah. Wah. Push. Almost there. Another voice was heard out of nowhere booming into Rowan's ears. The surrounding sensation became increasingly tight, causing Rowan to cry out further. Having realized what was going on, Rowan tried to squirm his way out, only to find that most of his body seemed unresponsive to his will. Push, push, you got this? Ow, that hurts though, oh nice, finally. You did it. Rowan cheered for his biological mother within himself, although he found it hard to accept her as his mother as of the current moment. Wah. Congratulations, it's a healthy boy. Among the many noises that rustled all around, Rowan managed to catch the feminine words spoken by someone. Slap in midst of him crying, he felt a stinging pain on his, but all of a sudden. Why slap me when I was already crying? And even the doctors don't slap that hard. Rowan thought in confusion as he cried out even further. Wa-a-a. Waga gaga, he surely is loud. A masculine voice laughed as Rowan felt another pair of large hands lifting him up. Just like you, dear, an exhausted voice of a woman was heard. Have you? Huff. Thought of a name for our eldest son. Why, of course. I've thought of it all night. The man said, seriously, your name shall be. Come on, tell my name. What will it be? Rowan thought in curiosity. One Piece World. So, no idea. Damn. What do I know about One Piece again? A boy with a straw hat named Luffy and... Yeah. Never watched a single episode. Hee <laughs> hee. Let's see what kind of cool name I'll get. Yuchiha Bob. wa -e -a -e -a. Rowan's cry became even louder, which induced another hearty laugh from the man. Wabigaga, you like it, eh? Uh. Crap! Rowan screamed at his lung. In his mind, of course. And so, Rowan's new life in the world of One Piece has begun. Ten years have passed since Rowan, who knew almost nothing in regard to the manga named One Piece, has been reincarnated into the world of One Piece. Monkey D. Luffy, Monkey D. Luffy, Monkey D. Luffy. Every day, Rowan did his utmost best, not to forget the only details of One Piece that he knew, which were the name and appearance of the protagonist. Knowing that troubles were to occur if the protagonist was to make his appearance in Rowan's village, Rowan had to be aware. However, now that he turned 10, such an idea didn't seem likely. Uh, did canon begin already? One Piece is a manga that centers around the theme of pirate, and yet, I didn't see any invasion up until now. Rowan may have believed that he wasn't really in the world of One Piece if he didn't cite the marine branch in the village. In contrast to the current era being called as the so-called Great Age of Pirates, his village, Kokuyashi, was quite peaceful, and Rowan loved it. Being strongest, richest, he doesn't care. He just wishes to live a normal life, if it even existed in the One Piece world. 
His goal was to live the laziest life possible. Bob lunch. The door suddenly creaked open, and his little brother, Pob, peeked through. Ugh. Can you call me Rowan instead? Pob just scratched his head. But you are Bob. Rowan sighed before exiting his room for lunch. Soon, his family all sat down for lunch. Hmm. 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 His father, Fob, was blatantly reading a large newspaper while stuffing a whole plate of potatoes in his mouth. Bob, Pob, do you see your father? Watch. This is how a true man should be like. As the sons of Uchiha, always be courageous and brave and cool and awesome and, as always, his mother, lass, was chattering nonstop. Ever since he could walk by himself, Rowan wondered if the world of One Piece was always this weird and found out that it's tolerable in comparison to the family he was put into. His family is good at heart. Through the years of spending time with them, Rowan grew to accept them as his new family. However, apart from that, he could not handle this everyday madness. First of all, how can his name be Yuchiha Bob? His appearance was tolerable, with average black hair, black eyes, height considered to be average in his previous life, with average looks. Everything about him accentuated his averageness, but his name is Yuchiha Bob. I will never accept this. I only have one name, Rowan. Oi, Bob, are you listening? Pob suddenly yelped out, causing Rowan to snap out of thought. Well, I'll explain once more. This father of yours has been promoted. Waga gaga, gashishishishishu. Pob laughed in response. Of coca coca coco. Before his eardrums got destroyed, Rowan managed to cover his ears just in time. Just who would have thought that weird laughs like that existed? All right, all right, congrats, Dad. I just remembered that I got something to do. Thanks for the meal. Not being able to handle the situation anymore, Bob. Cough, cough. Rowan fled from his home. Heading outside, Rowan was met by the beautiful scenery of Kokoyasi Village. As usual, he headed to the secluded Mekon Grove. Oh, Bob. As Rowan approached, he was met with Belmere tending her garden. Bob. Yuchiha Bob, damn it. It's so cringe. Upon hearing his name, Rowan had to suppress his face from turning into a frown. Hey, Belmere. Rowan greeted back. After arriving in this bizarre world, Belmere, Nojiko, and Nami were one of the few normal human beings he could converse without getting a headache. Others were generally nice and easygoing as well, but many of them, especially the men, were too smelly and unclean. They didn't seem to have cleaned themselves properly for years. So why are you here? Weren't you here yesterday also for a whole day? Won't your parents get worried? It should be okay. I'm still within Kokoyasi village, after all. Rowan scratched his head before sitting down under the shade of a tree near him. While peaceful, the world of One Piece was quite boring compared to the modern world, where many entertainments existed. He did know that this world consists of many methods to power up, since One Piece was the shonen manga. However, he does not know how to... Chakra? A key? Ryatsu? Breathing technique? A curse? Crap, why did I ignore One Piece, the best manga of the whole world? Although Rowan desired for a peaceful life, he couldn't help but berate himself for missing such a wonderful opportunity to entertain himself, exploiting the miraculous powers of this world. In the past, he did try to punch, but one punch on the tree injured his knuckle. He couldn't even lift up a sword, since he's just a small kid. One day... After a brutal event that resulted in him breaking his knuckle, his dad, Fob, cried so hard that Rowan felt a heavy guilt building up within him. After such an event, Rowan had no choice but make a promise to his parents that he won't harm himself in such a way ever again. Ha, huh, whatever. Not like it really matters in here, where no one from canon pays any attention. He just has to stay low-key throughout his whole life, like those extras who are not even given a millisecond to make an appearance in the story. Besides, to let everything down and live a carefree life. Yes, Rowan had to admit he enjoyed his current everyday life. You know that coming here every day won't grant you anything, right? If you want something, go to someone else. Someone as broken as me got nothing to spare for the others, Belmere stated as she watered the Mekon groves. I just came here to heal my broken soul. Don't mind me and just continue your work. Rowan wondered if he has become Shikamaru from Naruto. For the main reasons he visits Belmere's Mekon Grove quite frequently, 
are due to the sweet fragrance of Mekon fruits and calm environment where the gentle breezes touched by. Shrugging, Belmere turned around and went back to her business. Meanwhile, Rowan was simply lying down and relaxing, feeling the surrounding nature, coupled with the aroma of Mekon grove near him. However, the peace did not continue forever. Belmere, we're home. A loud shriek caused Rowan to jolt up from his position and nearly caused him to faint due to the lack of blood in his brain. Eh, Bob? Why are you here again? Noticing him, Nojiko, a blue-haired girl, asked. I was playing dead. Rowan couldn't be bothered to answer. Dead? Haha. <laughs> you are funny as always. Nojiko laughed heartily in response. Hee <laughs> hee. Since you intruded our ground, you owe us 10,000 belly. Since it's you, I'll allow you to pay back over three years. With an interest rate of 15%, Nami held out her hand with a cheeky grin. There it is, Nami's psycho mode. Once in a while, Nami would turn into a money-hungry lass all of a sudden. Wow, Nami, you are worse than that Nazumi Marine dude. Rowan responded sarcastically before yawning. Well, I think Belmere should be inside the house. Why don't you go and check? Watching the girls walking away, Rowan looked up at the sky and noticed that the day was already getting dark. Time flies so fast. Rowan had no choice but to return to his home and was given a warmful greet from his family as soon as he entered. Oh, Bob, you came back. Look, look at this. I just made a superpower airplane sand castle picture drawing. Pob immediately started to bombard words at him. Ufkakakoko. Perfect timing, Bob. Dinner just finished. Behold our dinner. Yuchiha special. Marinated raw fish. Last placed a horrific brown-colored fish on the table. Bob, come. You must take a look at this newspaper like a manly youth you are. Fob screamed with tears while crunching up the newspaper he is holding. Yeah, I'll never get used to this. Someone please save me. And yet, a smile was formed on Rowan's face as he joined the dinner. What a strange day, Rowan thought as he sat on his bed. It has been the first day in my life here that I woke up this early. I don't know why, but I feel like something bad is going to happen just has to be a false alarm, right? It's not like I have a sixth sense or anything. The experience has been something unpleasant. It felt like he got electrocuted, as if a god tried to warn him of an upcoming calamity. Calming his breath and wiping his sweat, Rowan opened the door and was met with his family. It was the same as every day. Phew. This pushed out the foreign anxiety within Rowan before his usual demeanor appeared. After having a meal, Rowan stepped out of the house and began to wander around the village, having completely got himself adjusted to a lazy life. I have now reached 13 years of age. I guess I'll soon have to start to partake in my role as a villager. Hmm. Should I be a farmer or fisher? As someone who has never fought, he didn't wish to become a guard that fends off the enemies. Since the educated knowledge from his previous life didn't seem to provide much use in this village. Rowan had no choice but to become a farmer or fisher, as Kokuyasi village specialized in agriculture. After aimlessly walking, Rowan sat down on the cliff that he found on the edge of the island. He stared at the vast ocean and sky in awe, which are things that he barely came across in his previous life. They never ceased to amaze him. However, something made an appearance in Rowan's sight, as it rapidly approached Kokuyasi village. Ha! Huh. What's that ship? It's heading towards our way. As the ship neared, some ferocious looking people with skin colors ranging from blue to pink were found to be standing on the deck. At the same time, the ship itself was being pulled by a giant creature that seemed like a hybrid of cow and fish. Witnessing such scenery, Rowan felt intimidated, as he has never seen something that bizarre in his whole life. That can't be a marine ship, I don't see their signature symbol on the sail. Which means pirates! I have to warn everyone right now. Snapping in realization, Rowan hurriedly ran back to the village with all his might. The issue was that Rowan wasn't fast at all. At 13 years of age, he didn't do any physical training whatsoever. Running from the cliff to the village took quite some time. By the time he reached his destination, he was huffing heavily. Noticing this, the surrounding villagers asked in worry, Bob, are you okay? What's wrong? Noticing Rowan in such a state, Genzo approached him with a worried expression. Pirates, I saw a pirate ship, everyone. 
It's heading towards us, Rowan said while pointing his finger towards the direction he came from. What? How? There's literally a marine branch near our village. Hearing Rowan's information, Genzo yelped in shock. Everyone hurry. Let's retreat to where the marines reside. They will protect us. Shahaha. Too late. Suddenly, a loud and sharp voice boomed throughout the village and caused the people to freeze. Rowan, gulping at the same time, slowly turned his head around and was met by several huge blue-skinned men with features that represented fish. Greeting humans, the blue-skinned man in the front, with a saw-like nose, growled with a sharp glint in his eyes. From today on, I, Arlong, am the king of this land, as the owner. Whoever lives here must pay the rent. 50,000 belly for each child, and 100,000 belly for each adult. With a menacing grin, Arlong shouted out, Pay or be killed. Rowan was engulfed in fear. Even though he was mentally an adult, it was the first time he was exposed to such killing intent. Even without realizing it, Rowan started to think, with his head clenched in his hands. Me, Pob, Mom, and Dad. 300,000 belly in total. We should have enough, right? Shaking in fear, Rowan and other villagers were about to walk towards their home to gather their fortune. However, just as they took a step, someone spoke out. No one pays anything. Before you kill anyone, you must go through me, Yuchiha Fob. To Rowan's horror, it was his own father. As the sheriff, I shall defend my village. Bang 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 Fob took out a fully loaded gun from his waist before shooting toward Arlong without any hesitation. However, Clang 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 the bullets were instantly blocked by Karubi, the second in command of Arlong pirates by his arms. In the next moment, all Rowan saw was his father getting slashed by Karubi's sword. Fob fell as the blood gushed out from the newly formed giant gash on his abdomen. Dick, dash, Rowan was about to shout, but quickly covered his mouth in fear. However, FOB, forward slash dad, Pob and last screamed, before hurriedly running towards Fob. Asterisk, cough, asterisk, I'm okay, don't come close. Fob shakily stood back up, with a large gash on his abdomen, before pointing his gun back at Arlong. You. Huff, you can never dash, puke before Fob got to finish his words. He was pierced by the sword that Karubi threw from his hand. Thud with a stoic expression, Karubi approached Fob, who fell without any sign of life, before pulling his sword out. Shahahaha, what is this weakling? Arlong laughed out loud, before turning his gaze to Lass and Pob. I am a very generous fishman. Although your filthy mongrel of a husband made me mad, I will give you a chance to repent. Pay up the double. 200,000 belly for you. 200,000 belly for your dead husband. And 100,000 belly for that kid. Furiously glaring at Arlong, Lass shouted, I, I will never give a single belly to you. Waha. Pob, who was holding his mom's hand, was crying out loud, with his arm covering his face. Watching this, Rowan was anxious. At this rate, his mom and brother will suffer the same fate as his father. Should I go out and do something? But how? What can I do? I can't even lift a sword. Rowan was stressed beyond belief as he clenched his head and pulled his hair. Even the gun didn't work. What do I do? Listening to the angered response of Lass, Arlong's face turned nasty as he signaled Kurubi. Wait dash before Rowan could register swoosh. He saw Kurubi slaughtering his mother and brother. Thud thud ah and no. No. Rowan's body froze completely as his eyes were locked onto his now deceased family, who were lying below Kurubi's feet, with blood spilling out. Why? I hope this served as a good example of what will happen to you humans if you are not to pay up. Arlong slowly turned back to the shivering villagers. I will give you three hours. After three hours, I will hunt you down myself. All villagers hurriedly scrambled in fear, leaving Rowan alone on the spot who was blankly staring at his dead family. Hmm. Boy, haven't you heard? Scram to your parents and bring money. Or don't tell me that, Dash. Stop. I'll bring money. He's my child. Sweating hard, Genzo hurriedly reached and grabbed Rowan's hand. Hmph, hurry up. Arlong and his crew began to walk away, leaving Genzo and Rowan. After staring at Arlong's back with a sense of helplessness, Genzo turned to face Rowan. 
Bob, your family, Mr. Genzo? Rowan silently muttered, with his eyes getting teary. Will you tell me what just happened? Genzo couldn't dare to speak a word but hug Rowan tightly as the tears threatened to escape from his eyes as well. From Rowan's eyes, the scene where his family was mercilessly slayed replayed over and over again. He felt his whole body shaking. Dad. Mom. Pop. My... Rowan's eyes wavered, and at the same time, he couldn't suppress the vomit that spilled out of his mouth. His whole world felt dizzy. From now on, you will be my son. Genzo gritted his teeth as he clenched his fists so tight that they shook uncontrollably. Those who survived must live on. Then Rowan's world turned black. Was the past 25 years of his life prior to the reincarnation pointless? Was he in the past life, in the end, simply a child in an adult's body? He didn't know. He couldn't think properly. Everything felt out of the world. To think that his family and friends, who were laughing and interacting with him a mere two days ago, were no longer among the living. Rowan couldn't help but lock himself up within Genzo's house under a blanket, shaking in fear. Where did it start to go wrong? Genzo was severely injured himself and had to receive intense care from Dr. Nako. If I tried something, something more than one lazy attempt to train, would something have changed? Belmere was killed by Arlong too, due to being unable to lie her relationships with her adopted daughters, Nojiko and Nami. Just what have we done to you, Arlong? Many other villagers he knew of, all slain. Rowan felt as if the world he knew for the past 13 years crumbled down. It felt like a waking call. He never thought carefully about how dangerous the world of One Piece can be. All he remembered was a funny-looking boy with a straw hat. He deduced that this world was not as violent or harsh as the other worlds, such as Naruto. Oh, how wrong he was. Peaceful? Not as harsh. Are you an idiot, Rowan? Rowan couldn't help but berate himself as he grabbed his head. Peaceful? An infamous shonen manga that revolves around the topic of a pirate peaceful? He never imagined that one day he will be in such a gruesome situation. Losing his loved ones felt more painful than dying in the previous world. Knock knock and knock was heard on his door before slowly creaking open. Genzo, whose body was wrapped all around by the bandages, walked inside and sat on the bed that Rowan was lying on. Bob, it has already been two days, hasn't it? Genzo spoke softly. As painful as it must be for you, you must overcome. Arlong is long gone to the neighboring area. Return to the world, and do not succumb to despair. We still have a bright future ahead of us, my boy. Rowan of course knew that he cannot stay like this forever. He must live on. He must overcome. Furthermore, he must avenge them. One day, just one day, I don't know how I'll do it, or what method I'll have to use, but I promise. I promise to take my revenge on Arlong and his crew, for all they have done. Although still shaking in fear, Rowan gathered his resolve as he clenched the hem of the blanket. Mr. Genzo, I... I don't want to use Bob as my name anymore. Rowan spoke weakly. Without my family in this world, there is no reason for me to use it. Bob is a name that he dislikes. The only reason he ended up allowing the others to call him in such a way were due to his love for his family. From today on, I am Rowan. Genzo sighed and gently caressed Rowan's head. If that's what it takes for you to come out, gladly. This is no longer the world I previously lived in. Throw away the idea of peace. For a peace without a power is not but a delusion. I must get strong. For the first time, Rowan found his goal in the world of one piece. Become strong enough to kill Arlong. Rowan held his shaky arms and uncovered himself from a blanket. I'm ready, Mr. Genzo. The villagers all gathered at the center of the village and saw Rowan and Genzo approaching. Mr. Genzo? Bob. Nojiko, who noticed them first, shouted in relief. Oh, as for that, Genzo sighed, before continuing. From now on, Bob is no longer his name, but Rowan. Rowan. Although confused, the villagers and Nojiko nodded nonetheless. And simultaneously, Rowan found that something was off. Where is Nami? Nojiko's eyes turned teary after hearing this. She was taken by Arlong and his crew after Belmere. Rowan saw nothing but red, out of the fury that he felt towards the Arlong pirates. Arlong again, he really felt like punching something right now. Damn it. 
What are they planning to do on Nami? Sam, one of the villager, yelled in anger. The group began their discussions on what they should do from now on. They thought of a rebellion, contacting marines, hiring bounty hunters, etc. But all ended up as a failure. They have already witnessed the strongest man in the village, Fob, get killed mercilessly. The marine branch was not responding to their pleas for an unknown reason. They soon concluded that the marines must be on the same side as Arlong pirates. Hiring the bounty hunters was impossible for them, since Arlong stripped them of all of their money. In the end, they could only agree that there is no other solution than to endure. At that moment, someone saw a distant figure of Nami walking towards them, with her head lowered. Nami, Nami, you are okay. Nojiko hurriedly ran towards Nami and grabbed her shoulders to inspect if she has been harmed. Did they hurt you? The villagers all visibly relaxed at the sight of Nami and let a slight smile escape their faces. However, Nami remained silent. Hey, I'm joining Arlong's crew, Nami muttered. Huh, I'm joining the Arlong pirates. Nami let out a forcible grin. I will get to be a navigator and draw maps. Ha, ha, what in the world are you talking about? Did they threaten to do something terrible to you? Please tell me. Genzo knelt in front of Nami, as if he could not believe what he just heard. No. Nami shook her head. He must have done something. Genzo burst out in anger. Tell the truth. No. Nami violently shook and released Genzo's grip on her. I, I got this. Nami raised her arm and revealed the tattoo of Arlong pirates. Everyone was flabbergasted. To think that Nami became a part of the crew, who not only destroyed Kokoyasi village, but killed her own mother, not you. Genzo said out of shock. Why? Nojiko said in disbelief. L look. He he look at this. Nami slowly raised handful of belly. They, they gave all this money that I wanted. No. Nojiko slammed into Nami, causing the money to fly out of Nami's grip. I'll never forgive you if you join them. Do you understand? They killed Belmir Nami. They brutally murdered her. Who cares? Why would I want to live like Belmir if it just gets you killed? I don't want to die like that. Nami shouted while struggling in Nojiko's hold. How, how could you? That's enough, Nojiko. Genzo turned around in an attempt to hide his sorrow. Leave us, Nami. Never set foot in this village ever again. Hearing this, Nami attempted to prevent herself from crying. Watching this, Rowan couldn't help but feel that something is wrong. Rising up, Nami ran away from the villagers, ignoring Nojiko, who was shouting her name. Are you just going to leave her like that? Rowan spoke out from the crowd, stepping up. What can we do about it? She betrayed us. One of the villagers shouted in anger. No way, that's true. Rowan grimaced. A ten-year-old girl, who witnessed the death of her loving mother in front of her very eyes, decides to become the subordinate of her nemesis, but what could he do about it? Run after her and tell her that she doesn't have to do it. For whatever reason it may be, a powerless boy like him? I hate it. Rowan lifted his scrawny arm and gazed at his open palm. This is the truth. Ha. Huh. Clenching his palm into his fist, Rowan felt disgusted toward himself. Why am I so weak? Why am I so... incapable? How? Just how have I lived the past 13 years of my life? As the villagers began to disperse in fatigue, Rowan, out of determination, thought within himself as he gazed up at the blue sky, it's time. It's time that I actually do something, rather than cry like an immature baby, even if it may be a helpless struggle, he will do so. If he ends up dying in the process, so be it. 48, 49, 5th, tie. Rowan struggled as he made his final push-up, before collapsing on the hard ground. It has been a month since Rowan began his training regime. He could not lift a sword or handle the recoil of a gun. He did not know any martial technique either. Special power? What? Like chakra. If it did exist in this world, Rowan didn't know how to gain, awaken, or use it. What option did Rowan have then? Not but various exercises that he saw from the internet in his previous life. He did not have proper knowledge in regard to training regimes. He barely worked out before. When he asked Genzo and others, they too did not know any about it, for they did not have any special training. 
Their strengths came from what they naturally had as they grew up, but he had to do something. Therefore, he began with a simple goal of 1,000 push-ups, 1,000 sit-ups, 1,000 squats, and 100 kilometers run. That's right, it's basically tenfold of all exercises Saatama from One Punch Man did. Start simple and small. Then, once you're used to it, increase the load. Add the exercises of more diversity. Plank, burpees, mountain climber, wall sit, pull-ups, whatever he knew of. As for today, Rowan was able to complete five sets of 50 push-ups, five sets of 50 sit-ups, three sets of 100 squats, and a three kilometers run. Although he was experiencing an exploding growth in terms of his stamina at a rapid rate, running still was a bit taxing on him. He still had a long way to go. I have to grow stronger. Stronger than Arlong and his crew, Rowan stood back up with determined eyes. I can't fathom how strong he must be with that tall height and muscular physique of his. I can't stay complacent simply because of a small improvement. Hell, I don't even know if this can be considered as anything in this world. Rowan was very paranoid. As someone weak, Rowan could not have a proper grasp of how strong Arlong pirates are. If he did overestimate their strengths, it was still much better than the underestimation, which will result in his death. Thankfully, he found out that his body in this world was much more tough and strong than in the previous world. When he waked up the next day after the exercise, he would not feel as much pain from overexercising. His muscles somehow miraculously healed by themselves overnight. This boon allowed him to last up to the present, unlike the other youngsters who fell off in no time. Having finished his daily routine of exercise, Rowan left the desolate area, which was surrounded by the palm trees that he was training in. Now, after some time passed by, with the money that he stripped from the villagers, Arlong built a luxurious building of his own, and named it the Arlong Park. A hideous-looking building, Rowan gritted his teeth as he thought of it. Speaking of Arlong, the villagers discovered over the past month that Arlong and his crew were fishmen, a race that lived somewhere in the Grand Line. This information only served to enhance their despair. Four years. In four years, I will make sure that I have the strength to kill them. Two years have passed since, and Rowan reached the age of 15. Rowan reached his goal of 1,000 push-ups, sit-ups, squats a long time ago. And that was just the beginning. Punching, kicking, long-lasting stamina, drastic increase in muscle mass and height. Including his past life, Rowan never tried as hard as he did now. Although sometimes, would something have changed if I began this sooner? Rowan couldn't help but ask himself such a question. He nonetheless continued his endeavor. Still not enough. No. Far from enough. I must get stronger than this. Rowan did not learn any fighting techniques, nor could he do so. He attempted to learn a sword, however, whenever he slashed once it broke. Gun. He didn't even think of an idea after seeing how the bullets that his father, Fob, shot toward Kruby had no effect on the latter. Simply put, the weapons in Kokoyasi village weren't strong enough to combat the fishmen toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Unlike the supernatural growth of his physical prowess, the weapons seemed ordinary. Therefore, Rowan decided to continue his training regime, keep punching the woods, stones, and whatever hard that he could find hone and harden his body to an extreme degree until it becomes capable of injuring them. Over the past two years, the villagers had to suffer from Arlong's crew, who continuously ripped off their hard-earned money. Facing such injustice for a long period of time, the rebellious mind within the villagers' hearts began to grow. It could be said that the villagers began to lose their senses, thinking that dying is no different to their current lives. Rowan had to hurry, Time wasn't infinite. On the other hand, Nami was seen to be exiting the Konomi Island, an island to which Kokuyasi village belongs to very frequently, although they had no idea as to what she was doing outside of the village. But if she was trying to worry Rowan, she surely did succeed. Rowan! Turning around, Rowan saw Nojiko and Genzo waving at him. Finished your training as usual, huh? Over the years, people finally adapted to his new name. Everyone now called him Rowan. Yeah, I cannot be slacking off when you guys are placing your trust in me. Unlike other villagers, Rowan was alleviated from his responsibility to work so that he can focus on his training. Well, you surely do look strong enough. Pointing at Rowan's exposed arms, Nojiko noted, 
Are you sure that you are unable to defeat Arlong right now? Nojiko has seen Arlong crew recently, when he came to collect tax, while Rowan missed them due to his secluded training. In terms of physical prowess, Rowan looked far stronger than any of them. No, we must be careful, Nojiko. Remember, they are fishmen. Their strengths are way above the average human beings, such as us. Genzo shook his head. Two years, right? We will try to hold villagers back as much as possible. Please, you are our only hope. Rowan gave a serious nod. He knew he couldn't fail. It was all or nothing, naturally. I promise. Satisfied with his reply, Nojiko and Genzo walked away. Recently, Rowan has been contemplating a combat strategy in addition to his exercises. He could finish 100M run in 7 seconds with his trained strength. However, that wasn't as helpful in a fight. What he wanted was a very quick, sudden burst of speed that allowed him to gain an advantage against the Arlong pirates. But how do I do that? Kick on the ground for like 10 times. Laughing at the seemingly impossible idea, Rowan continued his thought. Let's stick with a simple increase in my leg strength for now, so that one push will cause an extreme speed. Having finished the thought, Rowan stood up from his training ground. As he gazed into the sea, he sighted a small boat arriving at the village. Nami. Rowan thought as he sighted a girl with orange hair from afar. Was it that she let her guard down today? Nami usually reached the different section of the island that was quite close to the Arlong Park. However, today was different. That sack. Is it the money that you are carrying? Rowan thought in a mix of intrigue and frustration. Just what are those Arlong pirates making you do? Nami, who was landed on the ground with a sack of money, looked to her left and right with caution before sneaking her way toward the village. Rowan, who didn't see her for a long period of time, wasn't sure what was going on. However, he did see one thing. The hollow and sunken eyes that Nami had as she looked around. She isn't enjoying that at all. As I figured, Rowan narrowed his eyes. She's being forced into it. Taking a deep breath, Rowan turned around and began to walk back to the village. Just a bit longer, Nami. Hang on. I will get you out of there. And end everything once and for all. Two years finally passed by. Over two years, Rowan threw himself into tortures even worse than before. One finger push up, one finger pull up. Lifting up a boulder grabbing onto the branch of a tree with his body parallel to the ground for hours, named the hardest exercise that you can think of. Rowan probably did it. His punch was now capable of cracking a boulder in one go. His kick could cause a moderately thick tree to be ripped off from the ground. In comparison to a weak and scrawny boy that he was four years ago, he indeed made a drastic improvement. Was that enough? Rowan didn't know. However, he did all that he could do. The village has finally reached its limit. Today was the day. Rowan checked his attire, which consisted of the knuckle gloves for his hands and metal helmet to protect his head and neck that craftsmen made for him. This was the best Kokuyasi village could do for him, with Arlong sucking them dry of money. Rowan exited Genzo's house and was met with the villagers crowding around him. Are you ready? Genzo asked with serious face. Rowan returned with a nod. It's all or nothing. Today, everything will be decided. Several men stepped up with Johnny and Yasako, two best swordsmen mediocre, that the village got. Johnny, Yasako, when did you two return? I thought you were working as bounty hunters. Genzo exclaimed his surprise. We got contact from Sam. Johnny answered stoically. What kind of men will be if we were not to join this coop? We tried to contact the other marine branches to request for a help. But it seemed that without a sure evidence, they couldn't dare to act. Yasaka stated, after all, Arlong, is someone with ties to one of the seven warlords, Jinbi? Crap. One villager muttered in anger. Therefore, Rowan, you are our only possible chance. We will try to provide you distractions at least. So please, Yasaka gazed at Rowan with a mix of hope and guilt. Defeat Arlong for us. Thanks. I will be relying on you guys for this. Although he felt shouldered with burden, Rowan too nodded with seriousness. Rowan knew that what they are about to do now is a reckless action. However, seeing the bottled up rage within the villagers that was about to explode any day, he knew he could not delay any longer. He did not wish to see anyone else die anymore. 
rather if it's due to the rebellion or due to the inability to pay rent. Rowan began to take off his steps towards the Arlong Park, with villagers following behind. Stop. Suddenly, they were faced against Nami, who hurriedly ran towards them after seeing the commotion. What are you guys trying to do? With her arms open wide, she attempted to halt the movement. You guys can't beat Arlong. Nami, over the years, we found out what sacrifices you were making for us. There is no need to suffer anymore. Rowan stepped up and gently pushed her to the side. Just, just wait a bit longer. When I gather 100 million belly, Arlong promised me to free our village. Nami desperately said, in hopes of changing the minds of the villagers. 100 million. Rowan chuckled darkly as he lowered his head, shadowing his eyes. Nami, a filth like Arlong won't keep his promise. This I can guarantee you. Rowan gently placed his hand on Nami's shoulder. We got no more option. Village is out of money, and Arlong's tyranny continues. If we are going to die anyway, I'd rather die along with Arlong and his brainless fish pirates, rather than beg for life. Lifting his head back up, Rowan had a furious expression, with the veins popped out of his forehead and crazed looks on his eyes. Without a further ado, he passed Nami, and continued to walk towards Arlong Park. Trust in him, Nami. I believe that Rowan can beat Arlong. Nojiko spoke softly, with a hope in her eyes. Village will no longer abide by Arlong's tyranny. Genzo firmly gripped on his gun. You guys don't understand. You don't know how strong Arlong and his crew are. Nami shouted fiercely, but the villagers did not listen. Nami couldn't do much but stare at her tattoo hatefully. Everything she held dear to will be gone today. She knelt down on the village ground, void of the usual liveliness. After a triumphant walk towards Arlong Park, Rowan and the villagers stopped in front of the huge gate that lied in front of them. The entrance of Arlong Park. Time to put my trainings into use. Rowan clenched his fist and punched the door as hard as possible. To everyone's surprise, the entire door flew back with a visible fist dent in the middle before crashing onto the Arlong crew who were partying. Boom, who dares? Arlong shouted in fury as he and the crew walked out of the smoke and scathed. Arlong. Looking at the hateful visage of Arlong, Rowan could no longer control himself. His fists clenched in an absolute fury. Rowan ignored Arlong's crew members and began to walk towards Arlong. Hearing Rowan's furious outburst, Arlong revealed an annoyed expression. Kill him! He ordered to his crew members, who charged at Rowan, however, were blocked by the villagers who grouped up together like zombies. We will hold them off. Go, Rowan! One villager shouted out to Rowan as he struggled to hold himself against the large blade slammed by one fishman. You think a puny human such as yourself can defeat me? Arlong angrily shouted, before lunging towards Rowan with a blinding speed. As expected, he's really fast. Using his leg strength, Rowan quickly jumped up to dodge Arlong's strike. In the midair, Rowan rotated his body before letting his body fall while using the momentum to kick towards Arlong. Ha! Huh, what can a mere kick do? Looking at Rowan, Arlong held out his arm to respond against Rowan's fast ascend. Boom! Unlike what Arlong predicted, the force behind Rowan's kick was far greater, and as a result, he crashed into the ground. Don't give him any chance. Before Arlong could bring himself up, Rowan continually slammed his foot on Arlong, pushing him down even further. Boom, 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 the loud repetition of noise caused all nearby quarrels to cease and stare at Rowan's beat down on Arlong. Arlong Sen. The fishmen cried out in anger, but before they could help him, they were bombarded by the villagers grouping up on them. The villagers were like zombies, as even if one fell, the other one quickly replaced the spot, not giving the fishmen any time to take a breath. Under normal circumstances, such normal humans will not pose any threat to them. However, when they are scattered and each one of them had to face tens of villagers on their own, especially when some of them even possess guns, with the exceptions of few tough fishmen like Kirby, they were evenly matched. Enough! Arlong blasted out of a hole, despite the attacks he received from Rowan. To Rowan's shock, Arlong only seemed to have mild injuries. As Arlong readied his stance, Rowan grimaced. Shorio no Mizu! In contradictory to Rowan's expectation, 
who thought Arlong will charge towards him. Arlong shot a jet of water that flew towards him in an incredible speed, straining his muscle to extreme. Rowan barely managed to dodge it. However, at the same time, Arlong dashed in front of him, and before Rowan could react, he was punched in the gut. Cough Rowan crashed into the wall, behind as he vomited blood. Arlong was much stronger than he anticipated. Tooth attack, Arlong attempted to bite onto Rowan's neck, who managed to dodge at last second by rolling on the ground. In response, Arlong quickly threw a punch towards Rowan. Rowan jumped up using his hand, in order to dodge Arlong's punch. Right after, his feet landed on the wall, before shooting forward towards Arlong, with his two hands clamped onto one another, forming a fist. Arlong had no time to react, and received a blow on the chest. However, he endured. Subsequently, he bit down on Rowan's shoulder, causing him to cry in pain. Erg. Rowan was thrown as Arlong ripped a piece of flesh on his shoulder. Rowan felt dizzy. It was his second time after his death that he received such a pain. However, he knew better than anyone that if he collapsed here, his whole village will suffer. Shakily, Rowan managed to stand back up, earning an annoyance from Arlong. A human can never defeat a fishman, especially a weakling like you. Arlong snarled before taking out his saw-like sword. After I deal with you, I will kill every single human on this island. Asterisk huff asterisk, as if huff. I will let you. Rowan held his firm gaze onto Arlong. Even after all those trainings I have done, I am still inferior to Arlong in terms of strength. In order to win, I have to play smart. In truth, he was quite capable in physical means. However, Rowan lacked experiences and techniques in contrast to Arlong. This led to him believing that his strength falls short against Arlong. Rowan readied himself, and the moment Arlong charged at him with his sword, jumped up, causing Arlong's sword to be stuck on the wall. Following that, Rowan faked a kick on Arlong, who let go of the sword to respond with a punch, however, hit nothing but the air. At the same time, Rowan, who landed back on the ground, grabbed Arlong's sword and pulled it out from the wall. Arlong growled before shooting up towards Rowan in a straight fashion, with his sharp nose pointing towards Rowan. Let's see which is stronger, your weapon or your nose. Rowan slammed the sword on the ground as Arlong flew towards him, causing his nose and sword to collide. Boom! Unexpectedly, his sword broke. However, at the same time, Arlong's nose got bent. Standing back up, Arlong grabbed his nose and twisted back into place, without a sign of pain on his face. Afterward, he pulled out his broken teeth, and surprisingly new teeth grew right away. Letting out a cold sweat, Rowan looked at his bleeding shoulder. I don't have much time left. I have to finish this fast, but how? Keep running away like a coward you are. It won't change anything. Suddenly, Arlong jumped inside the pool, lying next to them. Arlong is a fishman, which means he must have some aptitude to water too, Rowan thought. To counter him, retreat to a high place. Rowan quickly jumped up towards the roof of the Arlong's castle. However, it was at that exact moment that Arlong shot out from the water at extreme speed, as expected of a human. Stupid! Arlong grinned menacingly as he sped towards Rowan, who was in midair, with extreme speed. This was when Rowan realized his mistake. To think Arlong can propel himself in such a manner, Rowan never thought that such a feat was possible. Damn no! Rowan braced for an impact as Arlong smashed into him, and they crashed into the building, causing a dust to rise and block their views. Boom cough Rowan inspected his body, which had a bleeding hole at the stomach, due to Arlong piercing him with his nose. Do you know what room this is? Shaha, this is where Nami has been drawing maps for past four years. Once she completes the map, we, the fishmen, will dominate the world. Arlong held out his hands with a laugh. And also, this room will be your grave. He. A weak laugh was heard from Rowan, causing Arlong to frown. Four years. In just a span of four years, my family, friends, everyone in this village. Just how much did we suffer? For years to draw. Huh? Guess how long it takes to destroy? Cough. Rowan coughed blood, but nonetheless grinned. Arlong is tough. But he did not receive as much damage because unlike him, my hits are blunt, which means 
Rowan glanced at a sharp piece that he acquired from Arlong's broken sword. My one final chance, even if I were to die, I will take Arlong with me. You. Arlong became cautious, as he realized that Rowan's action may delay his plan. In order to throw Rowan out of the mapping room, Arlong rushed towards Rowan's who was down. However, in the next moment, Rowan changed into a curling position with his feet touching the edge that connects the floor and the wall. When Arlong reached at point proximity with Rowan, Rowan suddenly shot his legs up with all his strength and stretched out his arm, holding a sharp sword piece in his hand. Crack Rowan slammed the piece of sword into Arlong's neck with all his strength, which was followed by a sound of bone crunching. At the same time, Rowan's hand was broken and bleeding due to holding the sharp piece with his bare hand. Arlong's eyes widened in disbelief before his grip on Rowan loosened and collapsed onto the ground, dead. Cough Rowan coughed out blood, however, limped towards the broken hole of the room while dragging Arlong's corpse with him. He got one more job to do. Arlong is dead. Rowan threw Arlong's corpse out of the room, causing it to fall onto the ground. Hearing this, everyone's eyes widened. Arlong Sen. Fishmen cried in disbelief as Arlong, with broken neck, came into display. Arlong is dead. Villagers cried in joy before turning our gaze back to the fishmen. Exterminate rest of them without a regard for their life. Villagers maniacally rushed towards those fishmen, blindly swinging and shooting their weapon. In the chaotic situation, one by one, fishmen began to fall. As the weaker fishmen fell, the villagers joined to help others, grouping up on the bigger fishmen. They looked like a swarm of zombies, with blood splattering everywhere. Even the Arlong pirates never experienced something as terrifying as this. The sheer hatred and maliciousness, oozing out of everyone's eyes towards them. Damn it. Everyone retreat! Karubi shouted to the other fishmen as he cut few villagers at once. However, those villagers, although holding their deep gash, continued to glare at Karubi. Some threw their weapon, some even bit on his shoulder. When he severed their limbs, they punched him even if it dealt no damage. Fishmen have never seen anything like this. To them, it felt as if they were in hell. Eventually, only the officer fishmen, Karubi, Hachan, and Chu managed to escape, while all the others were slaughtered. However, the casualty on the villagers were much more severe. More than half of those who joined the fight were killed, and more than half of the remaining lost a limb. Nami, who heard large commotion, rushed towards the Arlong Park, only to witness a brutal scene, a scene full of corpses and blood splashed everywhere. Mom, Dad, Pob, I've done it guys, I hope you guys rest in peace. Bleeding everywhere, Rowan wobbled, before the darkness consumed him. Ro Rowan, you are awake, Doctor. Feeling drowsy, Rowan heard someone talking. Before long, Rowan realized that he was on the bed. He could barely feel his body or more. He only managed to open his eyes heavily. Rowan, thank goodness. Dr. Nako quickly approached Rowan and inspected his condition. Blood level looks stable, no infection. Completely functional metabolism. Muscles repairing. Doctor, how long was I out? Rowan managed to open his mouth and a dry, hoarse voice was heard. He was given a water by someone else, which he greedily gulped down. Three days, you almost died from blood loss. But thankfully, Tomi had a matching blood type as you, XF. You should not move still. You had damages on the internal organs, muscle tendons destroyed, and many parts of bones fractured or broken. What happened to everyone? Well, we have successfully driven the remaining Arlong pirates out of the village. However, too many died. Rowan, you are awake. Another voice was heard. Turning around, Rowan was met with Nojiko, whose left leg and arm were in casts. Seeing Nojiko enter the room, Dr. Nako silently exited the room. Nojiko, what happened? Nojiko teared up as she spoke. Mr. Genzo, Johnny, Yasako, Sam. They all died. Hearing this, Rowan was devastated. Arlong was defeated, but at what cost? Rowan tried to speak, but no words came out. His bandaged arms shook as he tried to hold himself from crying. Genzo was someone who took care of him since his family passed away. Johnny and Yasako were adventurous men 
who would often share the majesty of the outside world. Sam was a great friend to hang out with, a meek individual who's kind to everyone. Everyone else, the villagers, people that he came to cherish as he spent 17 years of his life in the Kokuyasi village. I saw them there. They, they were the bravest, the strongest out of any others I've seen before. The weak, giving all they got to defeat the strong. They did not give in till the end. Nojiko shakily smiled while wiping the tears from her eyes. Ah, yes. I am glad that I got to know such amazing individuals in my life. Calming his mind, Rowan managed to respond with a smile of his own. A silence was brought to the room momentarily, as the both individuals coped with their turbulent emotions. After a few minutes passed, Rowan decided to ask, Where is Nami? Nami, she locked herself in a room, saying that it's all her fault. Nojiko said with a sigh, Stupid girl! She was the one who bore our burdens for years. How can this be her fault? Listening to Nojiko's banter, Rowan looked outside of the window. Finally, this village will be in peace. However, now that he achieved his revenge, what should he do now? Become a farmer or fisher? Somehow, the idea did not seem appealing to him anymore. Those were naive thoughts. What if they are attacked again? Arlong taught him that this world is not kind. It is full of malicious people, full of people with overwhelming power. I have to get stronger. All right, I'll let you rest. Nojiko finished her conversation with Rowan and left him alone. Closing his eyes, Rowan returned to a deep slumber. After a month, Rowan was fully healed, although many scars remained on his body. Finally stepping out, he walked to the graveyard, full of newly established gravestones, next to the one meant for Belmere. Dad, Mom, Pob, Mr. Genzo, Belmir, Johnny, Isako, Sam, everyone, Rowan bowed. Thank you for everything. You guys were the best families, friends, and companions that I could ask for. Arlong is dead. His crew is driven out of village. I hope you guys rest in peace. Rowan placed flowers he was given by flower shop owner on each and every grave present. Saluting for the final time, Rowan turned. Suddenly, a gentle wind blew giving Rowan a pleasant feeling. Thank you, Rowan. We wish you a luck in your journey from now on. Hearing a voice, Rowan widened his eyes with his fists clenched. Goodbye, everyone. Then he walked away. There is still one more thing to do, Rowan thought as he was walking. The Marines, especially that despicable mouse, Nozomi. For five years, the Marines were turning blind eyes on them. The villagers of Kokuyasi discovered that Nozomi was the one mainly responsible for such action. Arlong paid for his ignorance. Whether I become wanted or not, he must pay. Rowan has already thought of this matter before. Even if I want to try to go out of the village to report the corruption to other marine branches, Nazumi will never allow me to leave. Worse, if I manage to leave, he likely will hold the villagers as hostages. That leaves me with only one choice. Beat him up to a pulp, until he can't live anymore, Rowan and other villagers already saw the abrupt movement of marines. Nazumi probably knew that he had no other option than to silence the villagers of this matter, or else he will end up in the impel down. Rowan, where are you going? Looking at his serious demeanor, the villagers couldn't help but ask. No matter what's about to happen, don't come out. What happens here is done by my own will, and by my own alone. Rowan shouted before approaching the marine branch building. Halt. You will not step in any closer. If you do so, we will not hesitate to shoot you. The marine soldiers, who are guarding the gate in front of the dome-like marine base, with Mao's head decorated on top, pointed their guns toward Rowan. Every single marine in this building, Rowan thought in a fury. All of them are corrupted individuals who laughed as our villagers suffered every day. With an angry face, Rowan took few steps towards the marine guards before dashing towards them. Sweating profusely, the marine guards shot the guns in their hands. However, due to Rowan moving towards them in a zigzag fashion, they could not aim properly. Reaching in front of two marine guards, Rowan punched one in the abdomen before dodging another bullet from the other and throwing a kick at him. They collapsed on the ground while coughing out blood. Not even waiting any longer, Rowan quickly jumped on top of the dome-like building and hid himself behind the mouse head. 
Hearing the commotion, the other Marines stepped out of the base along with Nazumi. Chi Chi, who did this? Nazumi squeaked in anger as he saw two Marine guards brutally beaten up. He looked around the houses where the villagers were watching in fear. With squinted eyes, Chi Chi, which one of you has done this? Staring at Nazumi with cold eyes from top of the building, Rowan jumped down towards Nazumi, and Nazumi did not realize Rowan's descent until the last moment, when Rowan's shadow covered him. Boom! Rowan's sudden assault caused Nazumi to collapse. Before the soldiers realized, the dust that arose from the ground momentarily covered their view. Since Nazumi was with Rowan, they could not dare to shoot. Nazumi! Rowan's eyes blazed in anger as his kick crashed Nazumi down on the ground. Nazumi vomited out blood as Rowan's feet were pushing onto his chest, and screamed in pain as his back crashed against the ground. Asterisk, gurg, asterisk, Nazumi chalked on his blood, trying to plead. He please, don't dash, before Nazumi could continue. Another stomp from Rowan landed on his face, completely disfiguring it. Crack, a sound was heard, before the silence enveloped. When Rowan killed Arlong, he was so high with adrenaline, and fainted immediately. However, this time it was different. He killed a human being with his bare hands. He felt the sensation. He heard the plead from Nazumi for mercy. Still, Rowan crushed Nazumi without any hesitation. Rowan felt shocked and terrified of what he has done. However, he knew that he could not relax. He was still surrounded by the armed marines. The soldiers froze in shock and fear. The villagers who looked at this commotion from the windows couldn't help but feel conflicted. What should we do now? One of the marines said fearfully, Damn, what else can we do? Kill that man. We are not safe either. Another marine shouted. They knew that they won't be laid off either. Especially when Rowan knew them, ever, since they were patched to Kokoyasi village nine years ago. Immediately, each of the marines began to shoot to Rowan, who swung Nazumi's disheveled corpse to block the bullets. Running towards the closest marine, he punched that marine and caused that marine to faint immediately, before replacing Nazumi with that marine as a meat shield. As soon as they saw that, the marines knew that winning against Rowan was unlikely, even if he was alone. They would soon run out of ammo, however. Rowan didn't even seem exhausted. Fearing for the outcome, the marines ran away without much thought. Rowan, who was still troubled by his kills, could not bother to chase after them. Our Rowan. What have you done? The villagers slowly came out of the house, and one of them muttered in a horror. You will be wanted now, as a criminal. I know. Taking a deep breath, Rowan calmed himself down. A peaceful life? It was no longer an option for him. Just prepare me for a boat and food supplies. I will leave before new patches of marines arrive. Let's hope that the new marines won't be as corrupt or cowardly as this mouse. Next time this village gets attacked, I won't be able to defend for you guys." Rowan looked at his shaking hands, before turning his back on the villagers. I will be waiting at the beach on the west. I will leave right away, as soon as my demands are ready. As Rowan walked away, the villagers felt remorse, as this is all they can do to help Rowan. He freed them from Arlong's reign, and wiped clean the corrupt marines for them. Yet, all they can do is a small providence to prepare his escape. It was all because they were powerless. Asterisk cuff, asterisk cuff, what happened? Nojiko, who just arrived from the distant Mekon Grove, after someone told her of the commotion, asked. Rowan, he killed Nozomi. The villagers answered. What? Why has he done that? Nojiko said in horror. Where is he now? At the West Beach. We are to bring him a boat and rations. He will leave swiftly. Another replied, without asking any longer, Nojiko sprint towards the said location. That idiot! Nojiko bit her lips as she ran. Rowan sat on the rock as he thought of his next set of actions. So, I will be wanted and chased by the marines. What should I do now? I can't aimlessly wander around and get myself caught. Rowan pulled out a map of East Blue that he prepared beforehand. Lowtown is definitely a no. It's probably the area with the most concentrated number of marines due to its proximity to the red line. To hide. Small villages are not a suitable place to hide either. Kingdoms are likely to be heavily guarded too, so no. Which leaves cities or large towns as the best options for me. In terms of distance, this one, 
the city of Orem seems to be the best option. So according to this map, I would have to head northeast from my current location. Simply, I have to follow along the edge of Konomi Island before heading off in a straight direction and I will reach the Tempest Island. Head north by traveling on the land and I will reach my final destination. Rowan! Hearing his name, Rowan turned around to see Nojiko running towards him with a panicked expression. Why, why have you done that? Nojiko grabbed the collar of Rowan's shirt. Why put yourself into this trouble? Someone had to do it, Nojiko. Even if I didn't strike, Nozomi would have plotted something to cover up the evidence of his corruption. Rowan calmly explained, and we all know that I am the only one capable. So, are you just going to leave like this? After everyone died, you are just going to leave like this. Nojiko teared up as her grip on Rowan's collar tightened. I, I thought it was all over after Arlong died. Just why? I am doing this for all of us. In an attempt to calm Nojiko, Rowan grabbed her shoulder. If I don't leave, what will happen when the other marine branches receive this news? I will definitely be wanted, and if they discover my ties with you guys, all of us will face consequences, regardless of whether we are in fault or not. If there is one thing I have learned for my past five years, it is to always assume the worst. Even if I seem paranoid, this is the way Nojiko. Rowan finished his words as he saw the villagers carrying a small boat and densely packed rations, heating towards them. Rowan, these are your requests. The villagers placed the supplies in front of Rowan. Sorry, this is all we can do for you. We can only pray that you will be able to lead a happy life. This is enough. Thanks, everyone. Rowan stood silently for some time before continuing. Well, I'd better leave fast, for we don't know if the news already spread. Nojiko, send Nami my regards. Goodbye, everyone. Although emotionally attached to this village that harbored him for 17 years, it was time for Rowan to let go. Although he felt sadness of leaving his friends behind and anxiety from the enigmatic sea that he was about to go through, he had to toughen up. Getting on the boat, Rowan began to row the boat. He had to get out fast, since a simple boat cannot outrun the marine ships. When he was at a certain distance, he heard, Thank you for everything, B.O.B., you are our hero. You better come back in the future, Bob. Nojiko yelled as she stared into the horizon, where Rowan rowing away. Ha, hey, Bob, ha. Huh? Rowan felt nostalgic, as he did not hear that name for over five years. All right, it's time to begin my journey. Turning his head to the sea that laid out in front of him, Rowan's eyes turned determined. I will survive no matter what. It has been three days since he left the village. It was during the second day that he was met with the end of the edge of Konomi Island, signaling that he was not too far away from the Tempest Island, located on the east. Let's see, I can last five more days with portions of rations I have. In terms of money, I have around 100,000 belly in total, 30,000 from what I originally had, and 70,000 from what villagers gave to me. Rowan was calculating his travel. Thanks to traveling along the edge, he was able to dodge natural calamities. Although the straight course has risks, especially when traveling by a boat, Rowan, with his inhuman strength, managed to swiftly travel in the right course. I should be safe around here, even if this boat breaks. I simply have to swim my way across. The island should not be too far away. As Rowan was making some dumb thoughts that clearly will result in his death, he began to see land in front of him. Hopefully this is the Tempest Island. After a few minutes, Rowan's feet finally touched a ground again. Hiding a boat within a bush, although he no longer has any use, he packed up the remaining supplies and began his deter. Unlike Kokuyasi, this island is quite different. Rowan thought as he looked around, beyond the palm trees, which are thicker and larger than the ones in Kokuyasi, the place was booming with people. Bars were full of people. Nearby was a ring that looked like the Colosseum, where the bulky men were quarreling with swords. Hey you, yes you. Rowan turned around and saw a small man with a mustache, whose look resembles that of Mario, calling out to him. You seem to be new here, dear town. Who am I? Why, I am the greatest magician of the world, Jim Moss Clays. And Rowan asked while thinking, I smell a scammer. Let me show you a magic. It's a simple one, really. Do you see my hat? Jim Moss took off his cap, 
with an insignia attached, before flipping so that the concave section is facing up. Place money here, and watch what happens. Sorry, I am not interested dash, before Rowan could finish. He was met with Jim's shocking transformation. If not, Jim Moss suddenly bulked up from a dwarf to a 10 feet hulk. Die. Oh yeah, haha, I am interested all of a sudden. Alright, I will place 10 belly inside, with a shaky smile. Rowan placed the portion of money inside the hat, however. Jim Moss showed no signs of shrinking. Uh, okay, 10 more. Mm hmm. I am becoming increasingly curious. 100 more, I guess. Although Jim Moss showed no signs of shrinking still, Rowan's petty heart could not afford to waste any more than that. Hey, don't you think it's your time to show magic? Sir, that's not enough money. Jim Moss menacingly stood over Rowan before placing his money-filled cap back on. Since you insist, I shall show you a magic that can make a human disappear from the face of the earth. He pounded his fists together as he approached towards Rowan. Oh ho! Seems like Jim Moss the Money Titan found another prey. Poor soul! That kid looks quite young too. Haha, <laughs> who cares? Time to enjoy another beatdown. Drunkards and citizens alike. Everyone started to gather around the commotion between Rowan and Jim Moss. Licking his lips while gazing at the pocket where he saw Rowan taking money out from, Jim Moss made an evil grin. Mario ho 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 ho, you are one valuable individual, young and healthy, plus personal possessions. You will give me quite a fortune, Mario ho ho. Grimacing, Rowan clenched his fist and prepared for a battle. Suddenly, Jim Moss started to charge towards Rowan at a speed that seemed too slow to Rowan. What? I got scared by this weakling. Relived. Rowan closed distance in a blinding speed before giving Jim Moss a hard fist on the face. However, Jim Moss endured. Did fly just fart on my face? I didn't feel anything. Jim Moss snorted before charging yet again. I take it back. This dude is formidable, all right. Looking at how tough Jim Moss seemed to be, Rowan started to think his way out. I definitely do not want to attract any attention to myself. How will I make my way out? Then Rowan looked at Jimmy's hat. Money. I think I have an idea. Rowan grinned in anticipation, before setting off at a blind speed again. Before Jim Moss could react, Rowan snatched his hat, before spraying the money inside to the air. First come, first served, Rowan shouted, as other people's eyes turned into belly signs. No, my money. Jim Moss cried in fury and started to fight his way with money-crazed people. Taking the distraction to his advantage, Rowan managed to run quite a distance away from the commotion before entering a random bar to hide. Asterisk few asterisk that was scary. Rowan wiped a sweat before sitting down on a stool. Mr. Bring me your cheapest menu. Rowan quickly ordered before the bar owner's stare on him intensified. Just what is wrong with this town? I just arrived, and some random dude just provoked me out of nowhere. Such crowded town proved to be much dangerous than small villages, especially since it's lawless. Asterisk I asterisk, too bad I got no choice, otherwise I would never have come here. Hey, have you heard? All of a sudden, someone in a different table spoke out to his companion. This kid over here. Apparently, he killed that menace Arlong, as well as the marine captain. The other one who sat adjacent to the person who spoke, expressed his uncertainty. Maybe Arlong was just a bluff. Even though the bounty poster only depicts his back, this boy looks young and average. It just sounds so unreal. Rowan instantly froze, knowing that it was him that they were talking about. Slightly turning so that only his eyes can be seen, he carefully looked at the wanted paper they were holding. Yuchiha Bob, wanted, dead or alive, reward. 10 million belly. Rowan was shocked of the bounty on his head, but at the same time, was relieved that the picture took displayed only his back. Since he made sure to change his attire while on the boat, others did not suspect him to be the wanted man. I am glad that I have an average look. No one would expect that someone plain like me is a wanted man. Now, all Rowan hoped was that he won't get into any troubles like Jim Moss. I will have to reach the Orem City first. In such a large place, I will wash and forge my new identity as Rowan, a kind and good man. Afterward, I will be able to spend my time on training 
without as many worries. With a new plan in mind, Rowan gathered his resolve as he gulped down the food he ordered. After paying for the meal, Rowan rented a room in an inn for a night. Amazingly enough, for some unknown reason, the price was much more expensive than he had imagined. Dubious, Rowan went to check every inn within the town and found out that the original inn was the cheapest of all. My 5,000 belly, gone just like that. Even the food cost around 500 belly. This town is too expensive. Rowan huffed as he stomped out of the inn in the morning. Ugh, at this rate, I'm going to run out of money fast. Visiting here and there, Rowan managed to scuffle a few goods. The first one was the map of the Tempest Island. Since it was valuable information, it was sold at a very expensive price of 20,000 belly. He also bought a knuckle from a weaponry, which had sharp spikes, which cost him 10,000 belly. Finally, he bought a bag of salt, which was surprisingly cheap with 5,000 belly for hygiene. So, according to this map, Dia Town is at the west edge of Tempest Island, proving that I indeed arrived at my destination. Now, to get to Orem City, I need to go north. It shouldn't be that hard, since there seems to be a clear trail. Although I bought a meal, because of the bar owner's pressure before, I shouldn't need to purchase any food for a few days with these rations I got from Kokoyasi. However, getting to Orem City will take quite some time, it seems. I'll have to go through three towns, Arhantaria, Brinza, and Pezak. I just hope that there won't be many consequences of my travel. Having finished at viewing the map, Rowan placed it back into his sack, which was originally used to contain the rations, and began to speed up towards the first town on the way, Arhantaria, unknown to him. Someone came out from the back. It was Jim Moss Clay's Mario Hohoho. -ho -ho. He seems to be heading towards Arhantaria, brother. So he's the big fish you talked about? Another person with a mustache, standing next to Jim Moss, spoke out. Yes. Look at this poster. Jim Moss handed a bounty paper to the one next to him. Yuchiha Bob Bounty. Ten million belly. Surely. Catching him will bring us a huge fortune. It only shows back, though. How are you sure? Mario Ho Ho. Do not judge my intuition. I knew it was him the moment I saw him yesterday. All right. If it's just as you said, then soon we, Jim Moss Clays and Teaches Calm, will be swimming in money. Luigi hee hee hee. The duo laughed out loud before speeding their way after Rowan. Those idiots. Rowan thought as he secretly gazed at the dwarf duo who were hiding behind a tree in the opposite way. The way Chopper hides with one standing on top of the other's head. For the past few hours, Rowan tried to shake them off by speeding up, but somehow they managed to find him. Rowan didn't dare to try to fight them for two reasons. From his experience, one of the duo, Jim Moss, was a very tough dude to fight, and in order to wash his identity, he must restrain himself from standing out. Ugh, they are like cockroaches. When will they give up? Rowan continued to run fast, in which the duo barely caught up while looking for anything that can get the pursuit off of him. Hmm, who's that big dude? Rowan sighted a bulky and tall man with wild red hair from a distance. All right, let's do this. Hey, boss. Rowan shouted as he faked an excited face while running towards the red-haired man. Here, I brought the money you asked for. Please deal with those dudes behind me. Before the red hair could respond, Rowan threw approximately 15,000 belly at him and the red hair caught it without any emotion. Rowan instantly regretted the moment he has done this. It just sounded so dumb. No way anyone would believe this act. PFF, only 15,000 belly? Besides, who are you? The red haired dude made an amused grin before looking at the dwarves behind Rowan. Hmm. Looking at the red haired man, the duo stopped before their faces went pale. And Mad Treasure, the strongest man in Tempest Island, with bounty of 25 million belly. After a brief glance, Mad Treasure turned his gaze around to fleeing Rowan, not even minding the duo, who decided for a tactical retreat. Black-haired boy, I remembered your face. Pray that you won't see me again. Mad Treasure broke into a scary grin before walking away. Meanwhile, unaware of what happened, Rowan was just sighing in relief, since the duo were no longer following him. All right. Speaking of which, the town of Arhantaria should be near. Rowan looked at his map again, just in case, 
before continuing his way through. Meanwhile, in Kokuyasi village, Nojiko was holding a piece of paper in horror. Ten million belly. That's so high. Looking at Rowan's bounty, Nojiko sighed. We can't do much but hope that Ro, Bob won't be caught by them. Nojiko placed the paper down in front of Nami, who was sitting on the table. HMPF, he just left without even saying goodbye to me. So what if he has 10 million belly? He can die for as long as he wants. Nami briefly looked at the paper before turning away. After some silence, Nojiko decided to break the atmosphere and asked, So Nami, now that Arlong is no longer here, what are you planning to do? I'm not sure. How about you, Nojiko? Haha, <laughs> well, nothing much for me. I am pretty much satisfied with just tending the Mekon Grove. Nojiko said joyfully, You are free, Nami. You should do what you want to do. Nami truly didn't know anymore. Although her goal at a young age involved drawing the map of the world, her recent life solely involved the endless thefts to earn 100 million belly. Well, I don't really have any plan at the current moment. I think I will stay in the village for now. What Nami needed at the current moment was some rest. In the town of Argentaria, Rowan successfully found an inn to stay. To his relief, the cost was less than Dia Town, at 3,000 belly. Ha, another long day gone. Time to rest up Dash, as Rowan was about to enter his room. The door next to him opened, and to his surprise, it was those two dwarves again, marry a ho-ho. Jim Moss grinned with a hint of greed in his eyes. Yuchiha Bob. Teachus muttered Rowan's name as he rubbed his hands together in glee. I thought I lost them. Rowan was exasperated. He wondered if they placed something akin to a tracking device on him. So we meet again, Mario Ho 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 slash Luigi Hee Hee Hee. Do I really handle this right now? Rowan thought sluggishly, with his body full of fatigue. Wait, hold on. Rowan thought and slapped himself on the cheek, waking his mind up. They somehow found out that he is Yuchiha Bob. They managed to find me out with just that bounty poster? How? Rowan felt as he was hearing a loud warning bell to his plan of identity washing. No, I cannot blow up my cover. Huh. Yuchiha Bob? You mean that dude in the bounty? Huh? Come on, guys. Do you really think that someone as average looking as me can be an extraordinary guy like that? Rowan spoke with a passionate tone, trying to give his best in acting. I mean, look at his bounty. Ten million. Like what? He must be able to blast all of us off with just a flick of a finger or something. Marry a ho-ho. Too late to act your way through. The moment your fist touched me, I could feel your strength. Jim Ma spoke with an evil grin while rubbing his hands together. That ten million belly is mine. Shit, it's not working. Rowan thought grimly. The duo crouched, ready to launch themselves to Rowan. However, right before they were about to begin their assault, hold up, Rowan spoke up in a loud fashion, causing the duo to halt. Didn't you pay for this sin also? Why fight here and destroy our precious money? Why don't we fight somewhere else tomorrow? The duo gained a thoughtful look on their faces, seemingly considering Rowan's suggestion. Uh, because we are two people, we had to pay 6,000 belly with no discount whatsoever. He's right, brother. We can't waste this money, you know. Teachers seem to be tilting to Rowan's idea. Hmm, fine. Then tomorrow, at 10 a.m., we will be having an honorable duel outside the inn. After some contemplation, Jim Moss agreed. How the hell is any part of this honorable? Rowan thought inwardly as he faked a smile on his face. All right, all right. I'll be entering my room then. See you tomorrow. Rowan entered and closed the door to his room instantly. Good thing that they are idiots. Wait for tomorrow. Why would I? Not caring for the promise that he made with Jim Moss and Teachus, Rowan immediately opened the window of the room and fled right away, as silently as possible. Looks like I am not even getting time to explore Arantaria. On to the next town, Brinza. Rowan thought as he rushed through the dark. After the night has passed, the duo woke up with satisfied expressions. Good, good. We haven't had a good night's sleep for so long. Yes, definitely. Finally, a clean bed with no sign of bed bug. Now, it's time for our payment. Gleefully, Jim Moss and Teachus approach the door of the room adjacent to theirs. Yuchiha, Bob. It's time to uphold our promise. 
come out for the fateful duel. However, there was no response. After knocking a couple of times, something fell off, as they still didn't hear any response. Hmm. Teach us, what time is it? Jim Moss asked. Let me check. According to my watch, it says, 1 p.m. FFFFF. They gaped their jaws at each other, before rushing outside. No, we failed to keep the promise. Forgive us, Yuchiha Bob. The dwarves knelt on the street as they began to pour out floods of tears, causing the nearby people to scram away in disgust. Rowan just woke up in the forest, feeling chilly. Without much thought, he ate a portion of his packed food, before taking out his map once again. So, according to this map, this should be the Rouge Forest, which is located between Arhantaria and Brinza. I should be careful not to lose my direction here. Uh, now that I think about it, I should have bought a compass. Rowan scratched his head in frustration, out of his lack of preparedness. I don't have much choice. I will just continue to go in a straight direction until I see the exit. That way, I will at least be able to avoid ending up back at Arhantaria. Finishing his thought, Rowan continued his run. After a couple of hours, he finally found an exit to the forest. However, instead of a town, he only found a small village located on the borderline between the forest and desert. So it turns out that I was going in the wrong direction. Where am I? Rowan thought as he walked towards the village. Oh, hello. Welcome to the poor village. How may I help you? A middle-aged man who was tending his cactus garden greeted as he saw Rowan approaching. Scratching his head, Rowan asked, Hello, I'm sorry, but where exactly am I? He held out his map. Oh, it should be around here. The man answered, pointing his finger at the east of the Rouge Forest. Thank you. Quickly thinking, Rowan turned around and thought, It seems that in order to reach Orem City, I have no choice but to bypass the towns of Brinza and Pazok. I will just have to head off straight ward from here to the Rico town, located right at the north. Without any hesitation, Rowan once again rushed towards the indicated direction. Before long, he sighted a large town. So this must be the Rico town. It seems to be very close to poor village. Looking around, Rowan felt that this town gave off a luxurious vibe, as the buildings were well polished and cleaned, while the ground was smooth. Wandering around to locate an inn, Rowan was met with a large crowd gathering at one spot. Curious, Rowan peeked through the crowd with his superior height of 190 centimeters, and saw a blonde man with a monocle squeaking at a boy who was wearing dirty and worn-out clothes. Oh, the disturbances in the air, breathed out by one filthy rodent, brought immense disgust to my horror. Shall given be eternal rest, deserving of filthy rodent? The monocle man pointed at the child haughtily, while lifting his chin up high. What is this even? Rowan could not even understand what this man was trying to say, but to his surprise, people around him started to clap in tears. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Another legend created. Praise unto Sir Mardinas. Oomph. Sir Mardinas smirked, before waving his hand off. Scram, bug. Never set your foot in this village ever again. Quickly standing up, the child hurriedly ran away out of fear. What? Hey, are you just going to leave that kid like this? He stole my necklace. As the townspeople were watching the child leave, another boy, dressed in nice clothes and with combed blonde hair, shouted out. I mean, what can you do? He literally ate it. One of the townspeople responded. Erg, I can't believe this. He ate it, so what? I am going to wait until it's back out. The blonde kid ran after the other kid, ignoring the other townspeople, who were making disgusted faces. What is wrong with the people on this island? Rowan couldn't help but think as he witnessed the scene. As the people dissembled, Rowan returned to his pursuit of an inn, which he eventually found. Although the room was nice, it took a whole chunk of 6,000 belly, which is even more than Dia Town. Ugh. Seems like I'm left with a mere amount of 35,000 belly now. This is concerning. Rowan thought as he counted through the thin stack of belly he had in possession. Additionally, I am almost out of my rations, only amounting up to two meals worth. If I begin to spend money on food, also, my expense will become even greater. Damn. I've got to become more careful at spending. Ever since arriving at Tempest Island, everything seemed to be so money-oriented. It was as if he was in an entirely different world. 
He had already begun to miss the nice and calm atmosphere of Kokuyasi Village. No point in regretting now. I, I did not have much choice back then. I could not stay in the village hidden or travel to islands far distance away from Kokuyasi. Rowan sighed before finally having a good rest in the bed, which he didn't enjoy ever since Dia Town. On the following day, Rowan stepped out with an energized face with fresh new hope. All right, Dash, before he could set up, a girl, wearing a cap that covers her visage, suddenly bumped into him. Huh, did I just get pickpocket? Anxiously, Rowan quickly checked his pockets. To his relief, he did not lose anything, however, found a slip of paper instead. It read, Orem City, Hanks Bar. Sit on third stool from the left at 8 p.m. Why should I? Rowan snorted. Thank you, but no. Thank you. Not interested in dirty deals. Subsequently, Rowan walked up to an oblivious blonde man standing in front of him before accidentally slamming into him. At the same time, he placed the exact same paper inside that man's pocket. Qua, how dare toy to touch moi? An angered blonde man turned around and revealed Monocle. Sir Mardinas, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't see where I was walking towards. Rowan faked an apologetic smile. Humph, scram, bug. Never set your foot in this town ever again. Must be this dude's catchphrase, whatever. Rowan began his journey towards the final destination, Orem City. After the another day of camping in the wilderness, Rowan finally made to the entrance of the Orem City. It held a majestic view, large and tall buildings that he has never seen before, with people, with luxurious attires and jewelries all around them, booming everywhere. All right, I'm finally here. It's time to think of my grand plan of identity wash dash. Yuchiha B.O.B. Loud voices were suddenly heard, causing people to help in shock. Crap. Turning around, he was met with familiar gazes of two dwarves. Not you two again. Mario Ho Ho. Finally, we meet again. This time, we will ensure to take that bounty. Jim Moss and Teaches stepped up, grinning ear to ear. And just like that, my grand plan ruined before it was even born. Rowan facebombed before giving the duo a heatful glare. You know what? I don't care anymore. Taking out his spiked knuckles from his sack, Rowan put them on, before getting himself into a stance. Oh ho, finally. Luigi hee hee. Ten million belly shall be ours. Hearing this, the crowd gasped in shock. All right. Yuchiha Bob. Bounty of ten million belly. One of the highest bounties in the East Blue. One man exclaimed in shock causing others' jaws to drop. Such average man Dash is actually one of the worst criminal around. Mary Ho Ho, prepare yourselves. Jim Moss slammed his fists together as he instantly bulked up. Luigi hee hee. At the same time, Teachus became even tinier than he was. With our devil fruit abilities and teamwork combined, even you, Chia Bob, cannot stand against. Teachus stood on Jim's shoulder as they two got ready for a battle. However, Rowan is not dumb enough to wait for them to prepare. When Jim Moss and Teachus got ready, Rowan has already disappeared from his spot. What happened next completely shocked everyone. Crushed suddenly, Rowan appeared behind Jim's shoulder and slammed his foot down onto where Teachus was standing. Teachus's Jim's hand shook while holding the remaining corpse of tiny Teachus. Yuchia B.O.B. Vengeance shall be mine! Jim Moss angrily screamed before charging blindly to Rowan. It will be different from the last time, Rowan exclaimed, before pulling his fist back. Bang like a pistol, the blindingly fast hook of Rowan connected Jim's chin. Unlike last time, where he dealt blunt damage, the sharp spikes of his knuckle completely pierced through the tough skin of Jim Moss. Right after the fist connected, Rowan swung his arm inwardly, which caused the embedded spikes to rip Jim's chin. Arg. Jim Moss, who was released from Rowan, was heavily bleeding. He never expected Rowan to deal significant amount of damage to him, especially when the last encounter proved his superior defense. He has underestimated the power of 10 million belly criminal, and now he was paying for it. Before Jim Moss could register, Rowan immediately rushed towards him again and dealt a finishing blow to his chest, piercing through his heart. Jim's eyes dimmed before he slouched dead. Seeing this horrific scene in display, the people screamed before running away from Rowan. 
Rowan, in response to this reaction, simply sighed. Although Rowan may seem too violent, the bounty hunter duo Jim Moss and Teachus would have done exactly the same to him. Either imprison him in the impel down or kill him. He was not a saint who forgives death threat for no reason. Eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. Ha. The situation is not looking good, though. Soon, the news will reach the ears of the Marines and more potent bounty hunters. Since Tempest Island is mostly out of Marines' controls due to its location, I should have some time. Let's think thoroughly before making my next sets of decisions. Rowan hurriedly retreated to a nearby bar, without realizing that the title read Hank's Bar. For the past two hours, Rowan was busy hungrily gulping down the food he ordered, since he ran out of the rations on the day before, while he was on the Taorum City. As he finished, he sat up with a satisfied grin, while holding his enlarged belly. Ah, uh, I have not felt so full for such a long time. It did not take long, however, before his grin turned into a frown. What? 5,000 belly on food. You, uh, my hunger must have possessed me. As a good human being, Rowan had no choice but to pay up for the huge amount of food that he consumed. W-H-Y-Y-Y-Y. While Rowan was sulking, a door opened before someone familiar with blonde hair and monocle walked by. Ha, huh. Sir Mardinas. Rowan recognized the man who sat on the third stool from the left. Wait, ahaha, ha. don't tell me that he actually came. Rowan checked the time and realized that it was 7 p.m. This man came an hour early. Now that he took a look, Sir Mardinas had a different attire than before. He was wearing a golden suit while holding a rose in his hand. He looked anxious and sweaty for some reason. Wait, don't tell me that. Ha, this is gold. Rowan almost chalked from laughing. Oh man, I must stay and watch, no matter the consequence. I can't miss this out, sir. What shall I bring for you? Seeing Sir Mardinas unresponsive, a waiter quickly approached and asked him. This highness shall halt for the beauty under the moonlight, in prior to the deliverance of the heavenly meal that kind of stove may craft. Sir Mardinas answered, before leaving a waiter completely frozen, trying to process what he just heard. An hour, which felt like years to Rowan, finally passed. When time reached exactly 8 p.m., a girl with a cap that Rowan saw on the previous day stepped into the bar before sitting on the second stool from the left. Rowan watched intently as the girl slowly turned her gaze to her right before revealing a stupefied expression. Ha 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 ha. Rowan had to use all his strength just to contain his laugh. Aya, greetings, fair lady. The title of TH, TH. T this gentleman is Martio, no, Mardinas Marquis. Such fair being only deserves fair RO. Rose alike, and now we, um, we shall commence our heavenly ritual of ingestion. Sir Mardinas held out his rose with two hands towards the girl, while trying to look as cool as possible. The girl stood frozen for some time, before finally responding, Who are you? I, I, I am... No, who are you? This wasn't what I planned. My lady, Lady Dash, no, it's not you. Hearing this, Sir Mardinas looked as if he lost the world, with the rose fallen out of his hand. Meanwhile, someone could no longer contain his laugh. Ha 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 ha. Rowan ended up rolling on the ground, having the best time in the world. Wait, hey, why are you there? The girl's eyes squinted, before coming to a realization. Sir Mardinas, who was watching the interaction, couldn't help but get angry. Mademoiselle, this mongrel proves its worthlessness over the peacock in your sight. He'd no attention to a mere bug, and we shall enjoy ourselves. However, he was completely ignored. You. Watching Rowan's constant laughter right on her, with his finger pointing towards her, the girl's fist clenched in fury, while her face got red in embarrassment. Looking around, the girl saw everyone staring at them. Fuming, the girl pulled Rowan, who was still laughing along with her, to the outside of the bar. As they left, the bar sat in silence, with Sir Mardinas stared at the fallen Rose. See, cheer up, man. Yeah, don't worry, mate. There are tons of girls out there. Hey, want to join us for a drink? The men who were inside the bar tried to cheer him up out of pure sympathy. Ugh, ha, ha, ha. Staring at the sky. Sir Mardinas couldn't help but release an anguish scream. Hey, so why did you prank me? The girl angrily remarked as she pointed her finger at Rowan. Well, 
I wasn't planning to show up in the first place, to be honest. Rowan shrugged. I mean, what if it was a trap? Uh, fine. The girl seemed to be in a thought before talking. I just wanted to make a deal with you. The man with 10 million belly, Yuchiha Bob. Hearing that name, Rowan wanted to cry. Nonetheless, he nodded. Go ahead. Have you heard of Mad Treasure? Mad Treasure? That's not even funny. How can a treasure be mad? The girl seemed to be dumbfounded by Rowan's response. Mad Treasure, as in the strongest man of Tempest Island. With 25 million belly on his head, she pulled out a bounty from her pocket before showing it to him. Oh, I see. Hmm, huh? Rowan recalled the man to which he threw 15,000 belly to. Coming to a realization, his face turned pale. Oh no. Anyways, he is known to hoard tons of treasures, which is currently stored here in Orem City. The girl exclaimed excitedly. So what? If I meet him again, I am done for... No, no, hear me out. If you are able to distract him, I can infiltrate his safe and steal the goods. Afterwards, we can split, you know. The girl made a gold sign with her hand by connecting thumb with index. Once you reveal yourself, Mad Treasure surely will be interested. How does that sound? Yeah, as if. I can see what's going to happen. I serve as a distraction and Mad Treasure kills me in seconds. Or even if he manages to steal the treasures, I can't run away from him. Oh, even if I were to run away successfully, I would gain nothing in the end. You know why? Because you will take everything and disappear without splitting with me. Rowan rolled his eyes. If you know that I am a criminal with 10 million on my head, why don't you think that I will brutally kill you before making any suggestions? Are you going to do that to me? The girl said with puppy eyes. I might if you annoy me. Ho ho ho. I am the big bad criminal. Rowan replied sarcastically. All right, all right, enough joking. I will see you tomorrow in the morning at 10 a.m. in this exact same spot. Girl, I already told you that I am not doing it. See you. The girl walked away. Is she deaf? Rowan could not help but make a remark. Well, prepare to be disappointed. I am not some simp that wooing can make me blind, shaking his head. Rowan went in search for a nearby inn. On the following day, Rowan woke up at 8 a.m. from the rented room. So what to do now? Rowan contemplated. Perhaps hiding in the most unexpected place is the right decision. Traveling straight to east seems to lead me to Tatami Island, where there is 136th Marine Branch. Honestly, at this point, it's here or downward towards Jazz Town. I have to decide quick, though. Checking time, Rowan got up and started to make his way outside. Issue is, I am running short of money. How do I make more? On his way out, he spotted the owner of the inn, sitting at the counter. Hey, just wondering, do you hire workers here? Rowan asked. Sorry, but we don't hire criminals. Hearing such response, Rowan felt that the people in the world of One Piece lacked the danger awareness. What would the actual criminals do when they hear such words? Exiting the inn, Rowan went to the nearest hub to get breakfast. Give me the cheapest meal. Rowan ordered, and to his surprise, it was served immediately, an apple. Huh, how can this be a meal? You ordered the cheapest one. Eat up or leave it. The owner replied, without a care. Stupefied, Rowan stared at the owner, before taking a bite of the apple. To his surprise, it tasted absolutely horrible. What kind of shit is this? Rowan screamed as he stood up from his seat, dropping the apple from back on the plate. Hey, you call this a food? He picked up the fruit before inspecting it. Now that I look carefully, this isn't an apple. It looks horrendous. When Rowan looked back to the owner, he had jaw opened wide. A chow, a devil fruit, out of nowhere? I thought it was just a myth. The owner shouted out of shock. No, if only I was able to stop you for a second, I would have become filthy rich for life. What? Devil fruit? What kind of excuse is that? Just admit it, you failed. Rowan deadpanned before his eyes widened. Wait, devil fruit? Didn't dwarf duo mention that? Hmm. What exactly is that? Basically, a fruit that grants you power in exchange for the incapability to swim and very expensive. Power? What power? I feel nothing. Huh. All of a sudden, Rowan bounced from his spot. What is this? How should I know? Do you expect me to be an expert at devil fruit? Something I've never seen before? 
Just pay and get out. Due to the owner's violent outburst, Rowan was kicked out of the hub, with his stomach filled with nothing but a devil fruit. Rowan did not pay any mind, however, and focused on his newly acquired ability instead. What's going on? At his will, Rowan, although wasn't doing anything, his body was bouncing on the ground, as if he was jumping up and down. Well, this is fun. However, I have no idea what kind of ability I got. Thankfully, he was within the Orem City, where a large amount of information gathered. He visited the store and found what he was looking for. Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Although it cost him another 15,000 belly, causing him to go almost broke now. Figuring his ability out was of the utmost priority. Nope, not this one. Uh, wait, this seems like the one. After hours of flipping through, Rowan finally found the apple-like fruit that he ate. Bounce, bounce fruit. Classification, paramecia. Hmm, bounce. Rowan scratched his head. That explains it. So I can bounce anything. Rowan stood up from his spot. He tried to concentrate on his feet and imagine himself bouncing. Suddenly, with a weird sensation, he was bouncing on the spot again. Haha, <laughs> this ability seems a bit too overpowered. Theoretically, won't I be able to bounce off the attacks aimed towards my body? Rowan couldn't help but become excited. For once after arriving at the world of One Piece, he finally acquired a power that screams of fantasy. This was the power he needed, an ability that grants him an absolute defense. Coupled with his trained strength, Rowan thought that perhaps defeating Mad Treasure is no longer impossible. After calming himself down, Rowan began to access his full capability with fruit. According to the tests I've conducted, it seems that I am able to bounce any object from any surface of my body. The most important feature is that this bounce works even if my body is standing still. Although my body doesn't feel any different than prior to eating the fruit, I have few ideas to maximize the utility of this ability, but it will have to wait. Rowan halted his thoughts as he realized that the city, which was booming with people, became quiet all of a sudden. Ah, uh, let go, let go. A familiar feminine voice was heard. Rowan directed his gaze towards the source of the sound, and to his surprise, he saw a muscular man with wild red hair grabbing the girl, whom he met yesterday, by the collar. Mad treasure. Jararara. To think someone would dare to try stealing my treasure. Although mad treasure was laughing, his eyes were blazing in fury. My treasures belong to no one but myself. Hearing this, Rowan's eyes widened. She was the one who told him that Mad Treasure is the strongest on this island. Why would she attempt to steal alone? Yes, I'll let you go, naturally. After I am done dealing with you, that is... Mad Treasure grinned before raising his fist up. Shivering in fear, people ran away, afraid of becoming the victim of Mad Treasure's fury. Should I ignore this? Technically, that girl and I are strangers. Why risk my life for that? Rowan had to consider his safety first, before anything else. After all, his original intention of coming here was for his safety. However, Rowan couldn't be heartless. It isn't due to being a human being from a modern world or whatsoever. He already brutally killed Arlong and the dwarf duo. He just couldn't bear to watch a young girl get beaten to death. Wait! Rowan shouted, but nonetheless, Mad Treasure's fist connected the girl's face causing her to vomit blood and get thrown back. HM, aren't you that coward I saw in the other day? Mad treasure tilted his head. You wish to die as well. It was me. I was the one who ordered her to steal your treasure. If you are looking for revenge, you should be looking at me, not her. To Rowan's response, Mad treasure simply laughed. I see how it is. All right. Wait for your turn then. This girl, who laid her hands on my treasures, comes first. Hearing this, Rowan immediately propelled himself from the ground by utilizing Bounce, which stopped Mad Treasure from launching himself towards the fallen girl. Ho, oh, you dare to approach me? Mad Treasure watched Rowan flying towards him, before cocking his fist back. Then come as close as you want. Boom, Rowan and Mad Treasure's fists met. However, unlike what everyone expected, something strange occurred. Mad Treasure got flown back immediately, without any resistance. Mad Treasure quickly stood back up, with annoyance. Whatever devil fruit you ate, it must be the strangest one I have ever seen. Mad Treasure cracked his neck. 
Although I was the one who has been flown, no damage has accumulated on me, as if I have punched against a bouncy ball. Rowan didn't respond. After all, this was not an anime where you talk every one minute between each fight. One moment of distraction may be the end of one's life. Instead, he calmly accessed the situation. Does he have the devil fruit? I am not sure if he's hiding any additional strength. I have to be cautious here. Heh, you are quite capable, all right. However, the chains rose from Mad Treasure's body before instantly wrapping around him around. Rowan did not get a chance to interrupt. My fruit is superior. Mad Treasure was seen to be completely covered in chainmail-like armor, though it seemed much thicker. Rowan grimaced, for the thick armor seemed to be quite formidable. He quickly got himself into a stance as he saw Mad Treasure crouching down. Suddenly, Mad Treasure kicked the ground and propelled himself towards him. Rowan quickly sidestepped to dodge the incoming punch. Chain Pursuit Instantly, several chains morphed out of Mad Treasure's body and chased after Rowan. Bounce. Rowan calmly used his ability to knock off the chains. However, he saw that Mad Treasure was trying to wrap him around with the chains. He quickly bounced off the ground before the chains, which were loosened from his ability, tightened again. Seeing this, Mad Treasure grinned at the Rowan, who was in midair, before jumping towards him. Boom! Another collision of fist occurred. However, a different result was produced this time. Rowan's bounce is not invincible. Depending on his physical strength, there is a limit on how much force his ability can bounce off. Mad Treasure's brute force, which is enhanced by his chainmail armor, caused Rowan to fly up, especially since his punch was not able to match in strength with him in the midair. Coughing blood, Rowan looked down at Mad Treasure, who was seemingly waiting for him to come back down again. I really have to fix this habit of jumping myself high up in the midair. Rowan briefly thought as he started to fall again. Mad Treasure once again jumped with his chain-covered fist stretching out. This time, Rowan took a different approach. Instead of meeting the fist with his own, he slightly tilted his body before placing his foot on the side of Mad Treasure's fist. Boom! Through the use of the bounce ability, Mad Treasure was flown sideways before crashing to the building. Rowan, who used that time to safely land on the ground, quickly rushed towards the fallen Mad Treasure. His ability caused made it hard for him to damage his opponents. However, what if they receive the bounce force while their backs are surrounded by props? Answer. The force will go through their body, causing internal damage. Bounce break! Rowan unconsciously shouted out the name of his move before landing a punch on Mad Treasure, who had no time to stand up. He could only cross his arms to defend himself. Bang a loud, sharp sound was heard as the walls of the building behind Mad Treasure gained a spiderweb-like crack, while Mad Treasure himself vomited blood. Cuff, cuff. Before Rowan could pull himself away, Mad Treasure, while continuously coughing, instantly grabbed Rowan's arm, which is stretched out to Mad Treasure's stomach, before encasing it in chains. However, Mad Treasure could not keep Rowan on hold, as Rowan simply used the bounce ability to break himself free. You damn rat. Mad Treasure roared in anger. Rowan kept escaping him, with no chance to strike. It was starting to annoy him to great extent. Rowan heeded no mind to Mad Treasure's outburst. He should stay focused. One moment of carelessness may result in his loss. Although it may seem that he is winning at the current moment, Mad Treasure's raw strength is very lethal. His last hit has been hurting him until now. I have to be careful. What if he were to have any allies? Even if I win, if I don't the strength to spare, I may end up in a really bad situation. Rowan turned his gaze to where the girl has previously fallen and saw that she was gone. Well, time to make my own escape. Hey, Mad Treasure, look. That girl is gone. Rowan pointed at the spot he was looking at, causing Mad Treasure to turn around to where he was pointing. Without watching Mad Treasure's tantrum, Rowan slowly crouched down and blasted towards the far sky by combining his raw strength and bounce force together instantly. Huh. When Mad Treasure turned back, Rowan was gone. Safely landing somewhere in the middle of the desert, outside of the Orem City, Rowan wiped off the sweat from his face before quickly dashing off. What have I done? There was no reason to play a hero. Rowan mentally scolded himself as he continued running, 
just to make sure that he was out of mad treasure's reach. However, he wasn't aware that he was leaving footprints as he ran. Due to the haste escape, Rowan could not bring all of his possessions. He was left with pocketed bellies amounting to 10,000 and a folded map. He left his spike knuckle in his nolo sack, since using it perturbed his bounce ability, and it would have been useless against mad treasure with his armor. Rowan carefully looked around before coming to a stop. He pulled out a map. The middle of Tempest Island is full of desert. I have no idea where I am right now. Thankfully, I didn't forget to purchase compass during my stay in Orem. The best course of action would be to continue to the east until I escape this desert. Using compass to guide himself, Rowan used the bounce force to move at an incredible rate. As Rowan continued to travel, he noticed that his control over the Devil Fruit power has been gradually increasing as he continued to travel. He was using less amount of bounce force to propel himself in same magnitude, and he unconsciously adjusted the direction of bounce to align with his direction of movement. Now that I think about it, the bounce ability is technically an ability to control vector, with few limitations. I can control magnitude freely, but the direction will always be perpendicular to the surface of my body. Rowan thought as he ran. However, the bounce ability has another power that makes it very useful. It can spontaneously generate the vector from scratch. If this is the case, by generating the vector beneath my feet when I am in the air, won't I be able to freely move around in the sky by pushing off against the air particles? Looks like I got a lot to try out later. Previously, Rowan was able to run 120 kilometers in Kokoyasi. Now that he gained an ability of bounds, his speed was much quicker. He ran over the entire desert in one day. Although the sky has turned dark, Rowan relaxed seeing that he has managed to escape from the desert. Although the forest in front of him is not safe either, it was much better than sleeping in the desert, where the temperature drops by huge degree with a tire that exposes his arms and legs. As Rowan relaxed and walked through the woods, he saw a group of people partying around a campfire. Right after witnessing the scene, he immediately hid behind a large tree that was right next to him. Come out. We heard you a long time ago. A sudden voice caused Rowan to tense up even further. Don't worry, we won't attack you. We are just innocent civilians. Rowan could hear many footsteps heading towards the tree he was hiding behind. As quickly as possible, he used bounce to jump up onto the top of the tree before anyone saw him. HM, where did that person go? Rowan tried to get the clear view of the people, however, he could not, due to the heavy darkness around them. The campfire did not provide much aid in discerning their visages. Captain, what do we do? One man asked. Intently looking, Rowan saw the silhouette of a blade on that man's hand. Hmm, we might have misheard. Go back to whatever you were doing. Another man, with silhouette of a large hat and blade, replied. Soon. The group was seen loudly partying gain. Asterisk few asterisk, that was close. Rowan sighed in relief. If possible, I would like to avoid any trouble. I am certain that they are pirates. And does such thing called good pirates exist even? I have no idea as to how strong they are. So fighting is not an option. I need to get out of here, but moving will alert them. I don't want to play another hide and seek like I did with those dwarf duo. Rowan could not afford to stay on top of the tree for long either. Although he is successfully hidden at the current moment, however, once the sun rises, they will surely notice him. However, Rowan's sighted pile of supplies lying next to the pirates, containing water and meat. Food. Rowan could not help but rub his growling stomach. Abandoning his contemplation, he silently slid off from the tree before approaching the group. Hello, my fellow brothers. What do we have here? Rowan slowly approached the group. Halt. Who are you? One member shouted with his blade, pointing towards Rowan. Whoa, calm down, lad. Hello there. What business do you have with us? The man, whom Rowan previously recognized as captain, raised his hand up to halt the member. His eyes were stuck on Rowan's bulging pockets. Geez, of course. They are pirates, after all. Rowan internally remarked, before responding, Did someone come here a moment ago? I am currently chasing him. A notorious criminal with bounty of 10 million on his head. Hearing this, the pirates turned pale. W what? 10 million? See, Captain, 
That sound we heard before. It wasn't a coincidence, one of the members said as he shook in fear, anxiously looking around. Having looked at their reactions, Rowan accessed the situation. They are scared of 10 million. I think I should be able to beat them. Rowan slowly crouched down, earning the attentions of the pirates. What are you trying to do? One pirate asked in inquiry. Wait for it. Rowan started to draw something random on the ground, making the pirates confused. Now, Rowan suddenly jumped forward at an incredible speed before chopping his hand on the neck of the captain. Ah. The captain cried as he felt sharp pain on his neck. Captain. The other pirates cried out as they saw their captain scream. Ha. Huh. You didn't faint. Rowan muttered. It was an act, of course. He did not wish to randomly massacre everyone in sight. Since he confirmed their inferiority through this one chop, there was no need to pursuit for their death. Guess I will try again, Dash. Please stop. It hurts. The captain suddenly knelt with his hands rubbing together, his eyes full of tears. We surrender. We surrender. Rowan's sweat dropped. What are you guys doing? Hurry up and kneel. The other pirates quickly threw their weapons and knelt too. If you want to avoid any further consequences, you better dash. Rowan was cut sword again, as the captain suddenly shouted. Do you know why we knelt? It was to gain propulsion. Witness the power of our kneel pirates. Within a second, all of them jumped towards Rowan from their kneeling position at the same time. Not even amused, Rowan watched as all of their fists, which were clad in spike knuckles, the exact same kind he used before, approached him at once. Boom the next moment, with one burst of bounce force all around Rowan's body, they were all blown away at the same time. Arg! They all landed back at their original spots, in Dejiza form. T, that was just a prank. Please forgive us, sir. The captain shamelessly shouted. Please forgive us. The rest of the members said at the same time, banging their heads against the ground. Leave all your food and money right here. Then scram. Although angered at their shrewd attempt to attack him, Rowan decided to let them go. It was not worth to waste time on killing them. In one go, Rowan earned around 400,000 belly for himself. He was enjoying a good meal as well, while watching the pirates leave. Halt. Rowan suddenly had a change in mind. In response, the captain quickly turned around with a nervous expression. Why yes, where are you guys going to? The pirates could not help but cry within. You are the one that told us to leave. Nevertheless, the captain answered. T2 our ship, of course. Rowan smirked. As I expected. The pirates without a ship? Not possible. Seems like I found my way out of this island. Lead me to your ship, Rowan said, as he stood up with a huge backpack tied on his back, ignoring the pirates whose eyes moistened. After a week, Rowan was in the pirate ship, belonging to the Neil pirates having safely escaped the land. Since he did not have any suitable knowledge for navigation, he brought the crew along on board. While sailing for a week, Rowan did not dare to lower his guard. Although he was powerful enough for the pirates to abandon any idea of stabbing his back, however, he remembered from the hub owner's words that devil fruit users cannot swim. Rowan continued to experiment on his ability, or rather, in particular, whether or not he can bounce on the air. He has failed countless number of times. The main reason for this, as Rowan reasoned, lied on the fact that the air particles had large space around them due to frequent vibration. Pushing on them merely caused those particles to shift in position and absorb the force, instead of propelling him up. Therefore, Rowan has been modifying the bounce ability by making the expulsion of bounce force much quicker while preserving the same magnitude. By this split-second force, Rowan was hoping to gain the ability to bounce in the sky. He could do so much more than just floating. He could change direction in mid-air, not just by using his feet, but any part of his body. Although the precise control of the ability required an arduous work. After a week of practice, Rowan finally managed it. Although the knock-up from the bounce is very short, Rowan would no longer be as vulnerable as he was before. Also, this ability will only further increase as my controls gets better. Since I am able to do it, as long as I can add more magnitude behind this bounce, flying would no longer be impossible. Rowan thought with glee. Land ho. A lookout shouted from above. Hearing that, 
Rowan lifted his eyes and saw an island indeed. The island was quite small. It contained a single large palm tree in the middle, and all four sides were covered by a beach. There were countless ships anchored around, and among them, a huge ship, with something akin to saber-toothed tiger's head attached as a figurehead, was the most outstanding. Boss, we have arrived, the captain said excitedly, waiting for Rowan's response. So Helm Island, the island for the lawless, governed by the man of 17 million belly, the pirate Admiral Don Krieg. Before setting the course, Rowan has been contemplating as to which location would be the best to hide from the Marines. He did not want to stand out, especially after he has heard about the Marine hero, Garp. He had asked the Neil Pirates about any additional places not shown in the maps, and they revealed the base of Don Krieg, who spread the location of his base to the Pirates for recruitment. Although the Marines will soon hear the news, not only will it take time for them to mobilize and send troops, but Don Krieg is well known for the sheer number of pirates under him. In the end, Rowan decided that this island is the best destination for him. He would disguise himself as one of the cannon fodders so that he can stay out of Don Krieg's sight. This way, the marines and mad treasure will lose the track of him. When he can be certain, he will silently quit Krieg's crew and escape. All right. From here on, if they ask you guys as to who I am, I am just one of your crew members with no remarkable abilities. If you fail to do this, you know the consequences. Rowan said while holding his fist up and earned the nod from the captain, who gulped in fear. The Neil pirates had no problem with Rowan's words since their original intention was to join the Krieg pirates anyway. As the ship anchored on the island, the Neil pirates, and Rowan saw a bombardment of pirates, drinking and partying loudly. Getting off the ship, Rowan's group was approached by a man with short, spiky black hair and a gray headband. Jijin the man demon, the captain of Neil Pirates, whispered in awe. Jin, with mace over his shoulder, simply threw a piece of the metal to the captain of Neil Pirates. 27th, don't lose that plate. It's the indication that you are Krieg Pirates. Jin walked away uncaringly, leaving the group who were still looking at Jin in admiration. Rowan also faked the expression in order to avoid any suspicion. Welcome, fellow pirates! Suddenly, a booming voice was heard. Everyone turned their head and saw a purple-haired man with a muscular frame wearing golden armor. His expression was stern and serious, earning the crowd to quieten down before erupting in excitement. The ruler of the East Blue, Pirate Fleet Admiral Don Krieg. The pirate screamed, earning a haughty smile from Don Krieg. I suspect that according to my plan, in a few days, the Marines will gather troops and reach here. Therefore, tomorrow we will be moving out and sailing around the long way to avoid any encounter with them. At the same time, we will invade their empty branches one by one and rack up the fortunes. Don Krieg announced in a charismatic tone, and many pirates revealed their wicked smiles as they heard him. The Marines will never bring out their full force, and hence, that was the reason why they would group up to join forces. However, even with the remaining troops defending the base, it won't be enough to defend the sheer number of Krieg's fleet. As Rowan reached such a conclusion, he broke into a cold sweat. That does sound scary, all right. How will the Marines even defend against something like that? Our ultimate goal is to reach the Grand Line. We will swarm through the ocean for the brightest treasure in the whole world. One piece. As Krieg revealed his ambition, the pirates started to chant his name. Krieg, Krieg, Krieg. They believed that with their numbers, such a feat was not impossible. Although skeptical, Rowan too was shocked by the sheer size of the fleet, causing him to think that Krieg might be able to achieve such a feat now. If Krieg was just as strong, won't he be unstoppable? Thinking about this, Rowan grew uncertain. Don Krieg was just like Arlong, raiding and taking from the weak for his personal ambitions. Can I really afford to take advantage of this situation? Rowan felt conflicted. His original plan no longer seemed appealing to him. He did not wish to become a scum like Arlong. What should I do? During the night, the pirates began to pack up the supplies in order to prepare their departure on the day after. Under Krieg's command, the lawless and regal pirates moved in an orderly manner, which fastened the process by several folds. Captain, 
Rowan said in a commanding tone, making the captain of Neil Pirates, Rambo, which Rowan finally learned, because he had to keep up an act, flinch. Yes, Rowan, go ahead. Hiding his nervousness, Rambo said in a confident tone. Why did you begin piracy in the first place? Rowan asked in seriousness. Well, it was more like we were forced to become one. Rambo chuckled. We used to live in a junkyard called Grey Terminal. Poor and hopeless. Ridiculed by the riches and nobles, Gold Roger gave us hope. A dream that we can follow. We build our own boat by gathering junks from here and there with the belief that even we can achieve something in the end. He looked up at the stars as if reminiscing those times. Although we ended up like this after 19 years of piracy. Ha ha. Wonder what happened. Rowan was silent for some moments. Then he asked, What if you can be much more than just this? Ha. How is that possible even? We have given up such dreams long time ago. Surely, this is not the pirate life you have been expected, is it? Raiding and stealing from other townspeople. The very same kind that you used to be. Rambo's eyes flickered after hearing this. Observing Rambo's face intently, Rowan continued. I too lost my parents by the pirates. Only after coming out to the sea did I learn who the pirates really are. Ones that steal and kill. They are just filthy criminals. The real pirates harbor something much more worthwhile. Something worthy of betting their lives on. Rambo became nervous at Rowan's blatant words. He dropped his head and quickly looked around, only to find no one but his own crewmates, who seemed to be getting emotional. What are you trying to say? I am sure that most of us here in Krieg's fleet are the same, who, other than the heartless men like Don Krieg and his henchmen, would willingly plan this kind of evil scheme. Rowan muttered, It's now or never. Either I do it or I don't. Rowan took a resolute gaze as he stared at Rambo and his crewmates firmly. I have never told you, but I am currently a wanted man with 10 million belly on my head. Yuchiha Bob. Hearing this, the Neil pirates dropped their jaws. What if I tell you that I can defeat Krieg? If we can coax other pirates onto our side to make sure that no one interrupts a duel between Krieg and I, I win. Then the plan stopped. The fleet may dissemble or not. For the better, if we play wisely, as Rowan finished his words, he saw Rambo in front of him, trembling, to think that after 19 years, that I would finally come across to a person like you. Rambo clenched his fist. We, the Neil Pirates, will serve you as our captain from now on. The other crew members, who has been Rambo for the past 19 years, all nodded with tears. The hope re-sparked within them, as they looked at Rowan, who seemed more determined than ever. All right. Gather everyone, we have to plan everything smoothly. One night has passed by, and the day to set sail has arrived. At Krieg's signal, all ships began to sail at once, creating a majestic view. The hordes of ships, with Krieg's at the frontmost, surfed through the sea with ease. Don Krieg was standing on the deck with his arms crossed. He had an evil smile on his face, dreaming of the fame and power that will be on his hand throughout his journey. Suddenly, a quick footstep was heard. Turning around, Don Krieg saw Jin walking towards him. Captain, one of our fleet member discovered this slip from cabin. He said to relay it to you as quickly as possible. Jin handed a slip of paper to Krieg. Hmm. Krieg took the slip and opened it. Commodore Barry, as soon as you receive this message, call all Marine forces to join at 58th Marine Branch. We are in urgent danger. Don Krieg tricked us all. He will invade the base while our key forces are out. As soon as Krieg finished reading, he ripped the paper in fury. A spy. How did a Marine invade our rank? Krieg seethed in anger. Krieg knew that the Marines only received the news about his recruitment only today. He had a spy planted in each branch that he suspected to partake in the battle. However, the recruitment ended yesterday. This meant one thing. The Marines somehow figured out beforehand and sent spy in advance to prevent his scheme. Halt all the ships, Krieg ordered with a booming voice. Although the pirates were confused, they listened to his order. So it has started, it seems. Rambo, in his own crew's ship at the most back, whispered. He knocked at the door of the cabin. In response, the door creaked open before Rowan stepped out.
Are all preparations done? Rowan asked. Yes, Captain. I've managed to turn 15 pirate crews on our side. We will hold others off while you fight Krieg. Rambo answered. It's all up to you now. All right. Let the show begin. The ships in the front halted due to Krieg's command. However, the ships belonging to latter half continued to advance forward and directly crashed into the ships of the front half. What's going on? One of the pirate members screamed in confusion as their allies suddenly attacked them. I didn't join Krieg fleet to raid a village. Where is an honor in that? One rebel shouted as he jumped onto the neighboring ship while carrying his sword. Are you guys going insane? Meeting the sword of a rebel with his own. A pirate loyal to Krieg screamed. Watching the sudden betrayal, Krieg became outraged. How can this be? Does the name Don Krieg hold no fear? Jin seethed in anger as he watched the fights break. In midst of chaos, for ships directly advanced to Krieg's majestic dreadnought saber. Among them, a small ship, belonging to Rambo and his Neil pirates, was in the frontmost position. Boom, four ships all collided to dreadnought saber at once, and the pirates poured out from each ship, beginning the clash with Krieg pirates. Krieg watched as the scene in front of him unfold. Shaking in rage he never felt before, Krieg shouted, Wipe them out! Leave no one alive! Obeying his order, Jin and Pearl, who were standing right next to Krieg, rushed to the crowds. However, he was forced to lift up his mace to block a blade. You shall pass no longer! Rambo, although his legs were shaking, lifted his blade against Jin. Move, trash! Jin growled before rushed towards Rambo. Don Krieg's dream is not something you guys can trample upon. Jin's speed was frightening that Rambo, at his current strength, did not have a time to react. However, before the mace smashed him, another sword blocked his strike. Roly the Death Sonata. Joining the battle, another person, with an appearance of blonde hair and suit, intercepted. Music Slash. An arc of sword slash was sent flying towards Jin, which was easily blocked by Pearl, who stepped up to the front. Right after, he was forced to block two gunshots towards him. Let us help you also. Two more people jumped and landed next to Rambo with guns on their hands. The captains of four ships all gathered in one place to face off against Jin. Meanwhile, Rowan kicked off from the deck and landed in front of Don Krieg. Heh, Don Krieg. How does it feel like to see your plan crumble into nothing in an instant? Rowan smirked maliciously while cracking his knuckles. You, who are you? Krieg clenched his teeth while his hands gripped so hard that a piece of metal pole that he was holding onto gained a dent. No matter, I will ensure that you have the most painful death. Seeing that Rowan had no armor or weapon on him, Krieg snorted. Suddenly, the shoulder plates of his armor combined, and Krieg pulled a handle within, causing a blade to spike out from it. A huge, strange-looking spear was formed. Spread my name far and wide, Krieg. Yuchiha Bob shall be the reaper of your life. Rowan cringed, but nonetheless shouted out. That ten million belly brat. You think you can defeat me, the great pirate admiral with bounty of seventeen million? Don Krieg charged at Rowan, at the slowest speed Rowan has ever seen. Pulling his arms back, Don Krieg slammed his battle spear towards Rowan. Rowan quickly dodged it by jumping up from the deck. Subsequently, Rowan propelled himself towards Don Krieg by bouncing off of the air. In response, Don Krieg's spear separated, and he held them out as shields. Those shields then shifted and revealed a handful of gun barrels that appeared in an instant. While Rowan was still speeding towards Don Krieg, a barrage of guns and missiles were fired. However, to Don Krieg's horror, the weapons which shot towards Rowan at an incredible speed did not explode, however were bounced off of Rowan the moment they touched his body, and flew in every direction. Boom, 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 various parts of Dreadnought's saber got damaged due to the explosions. After facing mad treasure, I have been thinking of ways to bypass the armors and other heavy defenses, ones like you have, Rowan thought as he cocked his hand back. Three hit nail punch. At high speed, Rowan's fist crashed onto Krieg's armor-clad body. Bang, 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 three loud and sharp noises were heard, and at next moment, everyone witnessed a bleeding Krieg flying. Boom, a dust rose as Krieg crashed into the cabin. As the dust cleared, 
Krieg was seen to be walking out with the middle of his armor broken and oozing out of blood. Yuchiha. Bob. Krieg roared. It has just started. Krieg. Entertain me. Rowan shouted back, with his legs crouched for another propulsion. Don Krieg was dumbfounded. Throughout his whole pirate career, even the strongest marine he ever faced lost against the sheer quantity of his weapons. However, Rowan's ability to deflect attacks was unheard of. He was the direct counter for Don Krieg, as Krieg previously saw how Rowan dealt with his guns and missiles. Still, Rowan did not dare to rush to Krieg's proximity. He does not know what else Krieg is hiding, and carelessness will lead to his instant death. Slowly, Krieg lifted up one of the golden shields he was holding onto and pointed it towards Rowan. Ah, uh, it's the deadly gas poison. The Krieg pirates recognized what Krieg was about to do, even in the middle of the battle. Hurriedly retreating, they placed masks on their faces, including Jin and Pearl. Although bleeding, Krieg grinned as he placed a mask on his face as well. Let's see if you can handle this one too, boy. Deadly Poison Gas Bomb. MH5. One bomb flew out of Krieg's shield towards Rowan. Poison no. Looking around, Krieg pirates had masks on. If this gas spreads throughout the whole ship, only the Rebellion would suffer the damage and they will be at a severe disadvantage. Rowan inhaled a deep breath. Who oh, a huge amount of air was being sucked in by him. Rowan was using his bounce force internally on every inner surface of his mouth all the way to the lungs. This allowed him to compress the air to the utmost degree. He was currently holding much more air within him than usual. PSSSH the bomb exploded in midair right above Rowan and the gas started to seep out from the capsule. The Krieg pirates laughed as they saw the rebel pirate panicking. However, in the next moment, something unbelievable happened. Arrow Blast. Rowan thought of a Pokemon move as he expelled the air within him at once towards the gas above him. With a terrifying sound, the huge vortex of air gushed out of him and completely extinguished poison gas into oblivion. A Chow. Seeing this, Krieg couldn't help but scream in horror. His crew members were terrified, for no one has been able to dispel Don Krieg's MH5 in such a manner. Captain... Rambo and the others stared in awe as they witnessed Rowan's incredible strength. Is that it? Rowan gave Don Krieg a taunting smirk. Seems like 17 million belly isn't as much as I expected. Don Krieg simply growled at hearing that, but a cold sweat was going down his face. Not giving Don Krieg any more time to think, Rowan flew towards Don Krieg from his spot. Already used to Rowan's antics, Don Krieg held out his battle spear before thrusting towards Rowan's fist. However, Rowan's fist changed its course at the last second by using a bounce force on his own arm. It went from a straight punch to a hook. Boom, Rowan's fist struck the side of the extended battle spear before shattering it apart. Don Krieg grimaced at this before quickly pulling out a pistol from his pocket out of desperation. As Don Krieg shot the bullets to Rowan in point-blank range, the bullets bounced off from his skin without inflicting any injury. Rowan immediately rushed towards Don Krieg, whose size was towering over him. Rowan cocked his fist back, ready to slam it into Don Krieg. Hurriedly, Krieg threw a smoke bomb beneath his feet and caused Rowan's visual prowess to be obstructed for a moment. Watching as smoke blurred the vision in front of him, Rowan jumped out in time to see Krieg's swords flying to where he was standing before embedding onto the ground. Right after, Rowan bounced on midair to rush back towards Krieg. As the smoke cleared, Rowan saw a hole on the spot instead of Krieg. Krieg was underneath the ship. He's trying to lure me down there. In an area with limited space, he believes that I won't be able to dodge his attacks. Rowan quickly accessed the situation. Other weapons, I can handle it. However, that battle spear is a problem. Bouncing away such a heavy object is not possible with my control at the current moment. It is not blunt like how it used to be when I faced Mad Treasure, so I cannot meet the strike face to face. Should I go in or... Alright. If you're going to hide in the hole like a rat, stay there like a cowering baby you are. In sudden realization, Rowan smirked, before rushing towards the fight between Jin and Pearl against four captains who were barely holding off. At a blinding speed, Rowan landed in front of Jin and Pearl. When the latter two realized Rowan's presence, it was too late. 
Rowan placed each of his hands on their backs. Shock blast. With a booming sound, Jin and Pearl vomited a gallon of blood before falling unconscious. They suffered tremendous internal damage, as the direct contact with Rowan's hand caused the bounce force to blast through their body. Meanwhile, Don Krieg was wondering why Rowan wasn't showing up. His plan was just as Rowan predicted, to lure him into a secluded area where Rowan is unable to dodge. However, Don Krieg had no choice but to abandon his plan, as even after he waited some more, Rowan did not appear. He started to get nervous, as the clashing noise above ceased. Don Krieg threw another smoke bomb above the hull, and while the white smoke covered the area, he jumped up back to the deck. When the smoke cleared, he was shocked. Don Krieg saw all of his men, even the executives, lying down, dead or unconscious. Oh, here it comes, the self-proclaimed Pirate King. Rowan snickered as he watched Don Krieg with his jaw agape. Let me give you a better title for you. Bark King, all bark and no bite. The rebellious pirates surrounded Don Krieg, who became frightened. Quickly, he knelt down with his hands raised up. I surrender. Please, spare my life. Deja vu, Rambo muttered. Don Krieg has been defeated. If you want to live, drop your weapon and surrender. Rowan shouted to all the ships where fights were still going on. At Rowan's words, the other pirates turned around and saw Don Krieg kneeling towards Rowan. Don Krieg defeated. The rebellion cheered as the remaining Krieg fleet lowered their weapons in disbelief. In Lowtown, Pururu Pururu, as Den Den Mushy rang, a muscular man with silver white hair picked up the call while smoking a cigar. Captain Smoker here. Smoker asked in a grumpy tone. Report, Captain Smoker. Today, the Joint Marine Force located the pirate base of Don Krieg. To our surprise, however, we did not encounter any battle. The Don Krieg pirates were already knocked unconscious and tied. A voice from Den Den Mushy made a report in a restrained tone. What? We made an interrogation on them and found out that Don Krieg has fallen to the hands of Yuchiha Bob, an individual also responsible for the death of Arlong. Mad Treasure is already a headache by himself and now Yuchiha Bob, the weakest of all the seas. What a joke. Smoker gritted his teeth as he held on the dial from Den Den Mushy, breaking the cigar he was holding onto. We can't possibly let them roam around like wild dogs. Smoker hanged the call before looking at a person next to him. Call headquarter about this matter and issue my permission to chase after them. Smoker ordered. Yes, sir. Smoker exited the room as the Marine next to him saluted. Captain Bob, praise the Captain Bob. The pirates were joyously shouting as they looked at Rowan. Rowan mentally cringed. He would never get used to that name. Actually, my real name is Grimheart Rowan. After thinking of cool last name, Rowan proclaimed, It's time to change his name once and for all. Yuchiha Bob is the name of my deceased friend. I used it as my fake name to cherish my memories with him. Rowan said with dramatic tone, fake tear glimmering on his eyes. Wah. That's so sad. Tita think that was the case. The pirates all got emotional, and some were blatantly crying. All right, everyone, before we begin, I would like to thank all of you for making hard decisions. Although your past actions may be inexcusable, you have turned away from the wrongdoings for good. Let this be your first step. Rowan spoke as he held out his arms wide. Just like Don Krieg, I too have a dream. Rowan paused for a moment, looking at the pirates' serious faces before continuing to become strongest? No. To find one piece and become pirate king? No. To become rich? No, yes, maybe. But my true goal is to simply lead a happy life, free of concerns. Don't you guys do so as well? Ever since you began the piracy, your mind must have been worn out. You joined Krieg Pirates, not because of some ambitions, but to find a strong protection against Marines Every pirate nodded at this. The key to such life revolves around the trust. Rowan clenched his fist as he held up high, visit from island to island, and stop the other pirates from harming the weak. This way, even if the marines refuse to acknowledge us, the people of East Blue will gain their favor and become their friends. This is our ultimate goal. Yes, that's the life I want. 
I've always imagined of being the heroes like the Marines, but was forced to become pirate. One of the pirates cried out, If you don't agree to my ideal, you can leave. To those who stay, I promise you a different life. Everyone will understand what true pirates are. Rowan pumped his fist up, hearing Rowan's passionate speech. Every single individual listening to Rowan raised his or her fist up, mimicking Rowan's movement. Please accept us to your crew. On that day, Rowan's pirate crew was born. Yo, Captain, what do you think? A short man in large. Pink Jacket asked while holding a certain bounty paper. 25 million belly, yo. It's the same as wire number. Hey, 25. Sounds like a good finishing meal before my debut to Grand Line. The red-haired man. Mad treasure grinned. Then he stared back, locking his gaze onto the unconscious man who was severely bleeding. Let's go. We have no more use for this trash. Mad Treasure walked away with the pink jacket man, Psycho P, following him from behind. Jerara Yuchiha Bob, soon we will meet again, and when we do, that day will be the last of your breath. Marine Base G-11, the Marine Base G-11, located within the Grand Line, was exhibiting its glorious view by inhibiting the whole island. Within one office, a very large man with straight black hair and glasses wearing a black suit was seen to be busy on his paperwork. Pururu, pururu. The den den mushy rang all of a sudden, causing the man to jolt up from his work. Rear Admiral Batten, we have received a request from the East Blue that Captain Smoker would like for a permission to leave his post to pursue the rising pirates with potentials to become super rookies, Mad Treasure and Yuchiha Bob. HM? Who are those, even? Don't call me for such a matter, Commodore. Decided on your end. I don't have time for it. The rear Admiral Batten hung up the call right away with irritation. Wait. Batten stopped, recalling something. Yuchiha? Where have I heard that name again? Six months have passed since the establishment of Rowan's pirate fleet, consisting of around 2,000 men. They have been roaming throughout the entirety of the East Blue by dividing into different groups and preventing many malicious pirates from harming the weak. With such selfless acts, the majority of the citizens of the East Blue began to call Rowan and his fleet the Angel Pirates. Some began to help them out even, such as receiving the bounties of the pirates captured in Angel Pirate Stead, who are unable to claim the bounties for themselves. As Rowan's influence grew, the world government became afraid that the good deeds done by Rowan's pirate crew will reduce their influence over the East Blue. Hence, they made a few adjustments. First, they increased the number of Marines stationed in the East Blue to show that the Marines are still formidable and more trustworthy than Rowan's fleet. Second, they gave Rowan the official title of the Demon of the East Blue while raising his bounty by another 5 million. His total bounty is now 30 million belly in order to emphasize that Rowan is a brutal, violent, and despicable pirate. His name also switched from Yuchiha Bob to Grimheart Rowan, as the latter name sounded more menacing than the previous. Hence, the irony ensued, where the people within the East Blue called Rowan's fleet the Angel Pirates, while the people from other places called them the Demon Pirates. Meanwhile, due to the actions of the Demon Pirates and the increased number of stationed marines, along with Smoker's occasional aides, as he tracked down the demon pirates, the East Blue gained a new term as the safe haven. The malicious pirates were arrested without an exception. Receiving such news, those with malicious intents were discouraged from becoming pirates. With such huge impacts that Rowan made, even some marines began to see him in a good light. Some marine branches turned their eyes blind when Rowan fleet arrived onto their islands, while some even overlooked and hanged out with the demon pirates as if they were the best friends. Pururu, pururu, the den den mushy rang in front of Rowan, who was sitting down on his captain's room. Picking up the dial, Rowan brought it close to his face. Moshi Moshi, Captain you there? A voice belonging to Roly the Music Blade, who handles the second division of his fleet, spoke. Yes, I am on. Go ahead. Rowan replied, Captain, we have finally discovered Mad Treasure's whereabouts. According to one of our informants, Mad Treasure was sailing towards the Logue Town. It seems that he is planning to enter to the Sea of Grand Line. Roly spoke with formality. Thinking through for a few moments, Rowan replied, 
tell everyone to continue on with their current businesses. I will personally go with First Division to deal with Mad Treasure. Will it be okay, Captain? You told us that last time you two fought. You barely managed to escape. Don't worry. My priority isn't to defeat Mad Treasure, but to make sure that no civilian casualty arises due to his rampage. Besides, me six months ago cannot even be compared to current me in terms of strength. Okay, Captain. Rolly out. I wish you the best of the luck. Rowan placed the dial back as the call was hung up. Grand line, is it really worth to bet life? Rowan's curiosity ached. What particular reason is there to leave the safe and predictable sea? Just to encounter chaotic dangers and incomprehensible disasters. Rowan exited his room and walked up to the deck of the ship. The ship was quite moderate in terms of size. It was painted in gray and blue. The head of a lion was at the edge of the ship as the figurehead. On sail clothed, there was the drawing of the pirate symbol, which had an angel's halo above the skull. Below the pirate symbol, the word Grimheart was written. Rambo, we have an intel. Rowan said to Rambo, who was ordering around the crew members. Mad treasure reappeared. Mad treasure? Sea captain, I feel sick all of a sudden. I don't think I can go. Rambo faked sickness as his face paled in fear. Oh, I know a good doctor who lives in the island near this location. Why don't we go visit him? Dash, all right. Change the course to Logetown. We are already few steps behind, for we have no idea how far he is. Rowan slightly laughed at Rambo's comedic response. Don't worry too much. Our main priority isn't to defeat Mad Treasure, but to ensure that there is no casualty. After all, we cannot ruin our reputation, can we? Rowan smirked while giving Rambo's slouched shoulder a pat. Soon, Rambo recovered and began to give instructions to crewmates. According to my calculation, we will reach Logue Town in around 10 hours. With our Grimheart's max speed, the navigator notified while rubbing the wall of the ship fondly. All right, inform me when we arrive. I will be in the training room as usual. Rowan nodded before walking off leaving the crew members to whisper among themselves that training maniac. Jeez, not again. Did you see? Last time, I've seen him lifting up a boulder while doing push-ups. Why is he putting himself through that torture? The crew members shook their head before going back to their tasks. Rowan reached the training room that he made sure to place when ordering this ship. Due to the limits in the weight the ship is able to hold, Rowan was unable to add crazy stuffs like 5-ton dumbbell. However, the room still contained basic equipment, such as metal bar. Rowan grabbed the metal bar. Tightly gripping it, he began his daily pull-ups. One, two, three, four, five. Rowan was genuinely enjoying the exercise. Oh yeah, this is some good stuff, alright? He became addicted to the exercise, especially when he gained access to whole new equipments that he can use to work out. The time quickly passed by, and Rowan was still on his pull-ups, not realizing how much time has passed by. 80,080001, Knock, knock, Captain, you there? We have arrived. A knock was heard as someone spoke out. What? Ten hours passed by already? I, I was only able to do 80,000 pull-ups. Rowan sighed in sadness as he released the metal bar before wiping his sweat with a towel that he prepared nearby. All right, give me few minutes. I will get ready. After some time passed, Rowan and his crew landed on the ground. Everyone, patrol around the harbor and notify immediately if any suspicious ship or boat is sighted. This way, if mad treasure happens to be inside the town already, you will be able to stall his escape until I arrive. Meanwhile, I will be moving around and watching from inside of the town since no one else can keep up to my speed. As Rowan commanded, everyone nodded. All right, disperse. Rowan immediately disappeared from the sight of many, as he silently rushed through the town. Although the demon pirates are not deemed as threats anymore by the marines, unofficially, one has to be careful when there are few exceptions like Smoker. Additionally, Logue Town is the most marine-concentrated base, due to it being situated in the island right before the Red Line the doorway to the Grand Line. As Rowan, unknown by the commoners, has been observing the town, he sighted a suspicious man wearing a black hood 
muscular in terms of body frame, walking through the crowd. As the man looked to the left and the right, Rowan caught the sight of red hair sticking out of the hood. Mad treasure? Growing suspicious, Rowan didn't hesitate to chase after the man. Rowan followed as the hooded man rushed his way through the crowded street of Logue Town. All of a sudden, the man made a sharp turn towards the alley on his left. In order to avoid losing a track of him, Rowan sped up and turned left. To his surprise, the man was nowhere to be seen. Cautiously, Rowan looked around, thinking if he should retreat. There lied one suspicious door with the title Crawl's Bar. It was the most plausible that the man entered through this door. The question is, what if this was a trap? However, Rowan thought that there isn't much they can do to set up a trap against him. As far as he knew, the only weakness of a devil fruit was the ocean. How will they throw him in the ocean when he can fly? At the same time, most of the attacks on him were useless, when he could just bounce them off with ease. Gaining confidence in his ability, Rowan entered the bar. The interior seemed normal, with no particular aspect that stands out. On the counter, there was a bartender, short in height, wearing a round sunglasses and pink suit. Yo, welcome to my bar, buddy. What do you want to have? Yeah. Oddly enough, the man greeted Rowan with a rapping style. Although it was unique, Rowan didn't mind. After all, this is the world of One Piece. Uh, Rowan didn't want to reveal the fact that he came here in pursuit of Mad Treasure. He has thought that perhaps the bartender is an ally of Mad Treasure initially. However, the more he thought of it, it seemed unrealistic. On the wall positioned at his left, there was the printed papers showing that the bartender gained the official permission to set up and sell. Right next to that paper was the official confirmation of his identity. It read, Sai Chop, Age. 29 no criminal record, thoroughly checked by the marines as per to the request. Overall, it seemed like a desperate attempt of a bartender to avoid looking suspicious. Perhaps such behavior was involved, because the man has something he wants to hide, however, as Rowan stared at the man intently, he saw the man sweating profusely. Nah, just a normal bartender. Rowan dismissed his thought. Sir, what would you like to order, yo? Sigh, the bartender asked again as Rowan just stood without saying anything. Ah, oh, sorry. I think I will have... Oops, sorry. I forgot. To bring money. Can't order any. I'll come back later with money. Bye. Rowan quickly left, without giving Sai a chance to speak any further. Even if the bar owner is not associated, I am not taking any chances. Rowan mentally nodded as he exited the bar. Or he tried to. The moment he was going to open the door, the door disappeared. The moment Rowan saw that, Rowan immediately realized that this was a trap set up by Mad Treasure. Without hesitation, Rowan quickly slammed a punch on the ceiling, forming a crack, however, before he could do any more. Rowan felt drowsy all of a sudden, and he fell, having lost an ability to control his body. Suddenly, the colors that constituted the door and walls around, including the papers attached, melted away, before revealing gloomy, gray walls. Jerara, so we meet again, Yuchiha Bob, or should I call you Grim Heart Rowan now? Jerara, as the room made a complete transformation, Mad Treasure made an appearance right behind Rowan, while holding a stick with a stone of emerald color that was in contact with Rowan's back. Well done, Psycho P. Mad Treasure made a savage grin as he stared at downed Rowan. You seem confused, Grim Heart. This, this is what we call a sea stone. A fine addition to my treasures. Jarara. Jarara. I am feeling merciful today. I will give you a time to speak your last words. Go ahead. Mad treasure said as the chains rose from his fist and began to encase it. Ugh, heh. Although barely able to move, Rowan managed to raise his hand up. Before pointing his index finger up while making a weak grin. Hmm. Before mad treasure and psycho P could realize... The whole ceiling of the building crashed down onto them. Boom, huh? What's going on? Run. The people yelped as the building collapsed all of a sudden. Hwa. Mad treasure stood up from the piles and scathed, with the chains covering the entirety of his body. On the other hand, Psycho P seemed to have gone unconscious, with his head bleeding. Huff huff, Rowan's state was not good as he stood up from the piles. Due to the sea stone, 
Rowan couldn't use his Devil Fruit power until he already received substantial amount of damage. Currently, various parts of his body, including the left arm, left leg, and few ribs were broken, while severely bleeding. He was only able to save the right part of his body at the last moment, pestering me like a cockroach every single time. To think I have to go all out against the likes of you, with annoyed face. Mad Treasure was about to rush towards Rowan, however, saw the marines quickly rushing towards them. TCH, consider yourself lucky, Grimheart. Next time we meet, I will ensure that you are erased from this world. After the outburst, Mad Treasure grabbed Psycho, P, and fled. Damn it. I have become complacent with my abilities. I, I wouldn't have thought things such as Sea Stone would have existed. Rowan clenched his right fist in self-ridicule, before flying away from the commotion by using his right leg. As he went back to the location of his ship, all he saw were Rambo and others all brutally beaten up unconscious and their ship gone. It seems that this was Mad Treasure's plan from the start all along. Lure Rowan's crew, kill Rowan although failed, steal their ship and escape to Grand Line while the Marines are occupied with Rowan's crew. They were completely fooled by Mad Treasure. As blood kept leaving his body, Rowan became drowsy. No, I can't faint here. The world turned dark on him as he dropped on the ground, unconscious. Clang with the sound of a key locking the bar. Rowan slowly came to a consciousness. Ugh, where am I? His vision was blurry, and his head felt dizzy. He could not get a clear sense of what was going on around him. A key, metal sound, metal met, mad treasure. Remembering what has occurred, Rowan jolted up, before grimacing in pain. He looked at his body, which was wrapped all around with bandage. So, I have... Mad Treasure managed to get away, his vision slowly cleared up, and Rowan finally came to view what situation he was in. He was lying on a hard bed, made out of rock. There was a hole nearby, for toiletry. Looking forward, Rowan saw metal bars. He was imprisoned. Eh, seems like you are awake. One of the guards, who was guarding Rowan's prison cell, exclaimed. A big fish with thirty million belly. The demon of the East Blue, Grim Heart Rowan. Who would have thought that you would be caught like this? Why did you treat my wounds? Rowan was visibly confused. Why wouldn't they just kill him? He knew from the world government's antics that he was nuisance to them. How would we know? All we heard is that you are to be trans-allocated to Dr. Vegapunk's laboratory in a couple of days. The marine hero, Garp, will personally come to pick you up. Haha. <laughs> One guard laughed. Oh, don't worry. Soon. You will be suffering a fate worse than what your crew mates have gone through. Look forward to it. Stop. Just continue guarding. The other guard sighed while holding his hand up. Turning to Rowan, he sighed again and shook his head. If only you didn't kill the Marine Captain before. You might have had your chance in Marine. You brought this upon yourself. Hearing this, Rowan couldn't help but give out a hollow laugh. Haha, <laughs> this is the so-called Justice of the Marine. I have defeated or killed Arlong, Don Krieg, corrupted marines, and other evildoers, all by myself. In fact, aren't I closer to the definition of justice than you? The guards didn't reply and his words got ignored. In the end, what was the point? Were my actions up until now in vain? Looking at his sea stone cuff over the bandages, Rowan growled in remorse. Was it wrong to wish for everyone's safety? Was it too unrealistic? I just wanted to lead a safe and joyful life. Rowan could do nothing but only stare at the ceiling in sadness. Rambo, Jerry, Brandy, everyone, I am sorry. The first division all got executed without any hesitation from the Marines. Previously, Rowan thought that all good wills his fleet has done will bring good results. He saw the Marines revealing good intentions to them in the past. It seems that he was naive. He has forgotten that this world was cruel, and has been viewing the world too optimistically. There was nothing that he could do, except to wait for his fate. For the next two days, Rowan lived through a torture, minimal water and dry food, continuous ridicules from the guards and the passers-by. He could handle those, for he still had a hope. This said hope crashed when he heard that the rest of his fleet betrayed him. All he could think of was, was my life in vain, and the third night has come. 
Rowan was lying down on the stone bed, with his eyes hollowed out, having ceased to think any longer. Thud, thud, all of a sudden, the guards in front of Rowan's cell fell. Although Rowan heard it, it invoked no response from him. Clang, a sound of key unlocking the lock was heard. Tap, tap, a sound of someone hurriedly running towards him. Said individual stopped in front of him, before taking out another key to unlock his sea stone cuff. Rowan lazily moved his gaze onto an individual who infiltrated into his prison cell, before his eyes widened. You. You are Dash's mouth was quickly blocked before it could speak any longer. The figure standing was the girl with short light purple hair, whom he has previous saved from mad treasure at the Orem. Six months ago? Sure, I have barely managed to break through here. Jeez. Why are there so many guards stationed? Hurry. Let's leave. They will find out in no time. Grabbing his arm, the girl yanked him towards the exit. If I am correct, the second patch of guards will come to replace this group after an hour, approximately. However, the patrol guards check this cell every five minutes. Their rotation is counterclockwise, which means they will be coming from that direction. The girl muttered before pulling Rowan through the prison. All right. Thankfully, the prison here isn't that big due to the fact that all prisoners tend to get shipped to the Impel Down. Making through the entrance will be impossible, since it's heavily guarded. Seeing that the girl seems troubled, Rowan placed his hand on the wall, before breaking the portion into pieces with his bounce. Oh, how convenient. Come on, let's go. They swiftly managed to escape the prison. The girl let Rowan in such a way that they avoided any major street, they soon arrived at the harbor, where a small boat was anchored. Beep beep a high-pitched noise ensued from the prison, signaling that a prisoner has escaped. The marines began to pour out of the base in a hurry, quickly running to cover every direction. Hurry, get on the boat! Rowan and the girl quickly got on the boat. Using his bounce force to blast off of the air, the boat propelled at a very high speed. By the time the marines reached the harbor, the boat was long gone from the sight. As the boat reached in the middle of the ocean, Rowan stared at the night full of sky, seemingly amazed by the view that he hasn't seen for the past few days. After admiring the view, Rowan's expression became hollow. Why did you save me? Risking your life? Isn't it too risky? Rowan softly spoke. Hee hee, you owe me 30 million belly for saving your life. In response, the girl simply held out his tongue and winked. Then, her expression turned serious. Just joking, haha. I just happened to be there at that time, and I couldn't ignore the fact that the person caught is the savior of my life. It's funny how it turned out. My closest crew, mates killed off without any compensation for good things they have done, just because they were already close to death. The others from my fleet turned their back on us and announced the establishment of Roly Fleet. Rowan said with a laugh, haha, all of this happened within a week. Isn't life so unpredictable? The girl stayed silent for a moment, listening to Rowan. As if contemplating something, she spoke up. Well, if you say it like that, I can't disagree. Disowned by my own father, surviving on the streets and making a living by thefts, encountering mad treasure, and you. You might not have known, but ever since I was born, you were the first one who were good to me. From that moment, I knew that you are a good person. They stayed on the boat in resolute silence as the wind directed the boat to somewhere that none of them knows. Hey, Rowan opened his mouth. I forgot to ask, what's your name? Ha, hey, I was wondering when you would say that. The girl replied with a wide smile. After all, what kind of person doesn't even know one's savior? I am Karina, nice to meet you. The girl, now known as Karina, grinned as she held out a hand. Smiling back, Rowan grabbed the outstretched hand and shook. Kinda late to say this, but thank you for saving me, Karina. A day has risen in the Carroll Town, belonging to the Cross Island that is located at the south of the East Blue. After Rowan and Karina's successful escape, the Marines attempted for an immediate chase. However, using Rowan's bounce force, they swiftly reached the Grandeur Island. Right after landing, they quickly disguised themselves before stealing a boat and heading to the Cross Island. When Marines arrived at the Grandeur Island, they could no longer track the duo down. Currently, using the money Karina got on herself, they recuperated in an inn. They have been sitting on the table, thinking about their next course of action. 
So are you going to continue your angel pirates? Karina said mockingly. Ha, as if. Rowan snorted in response before speaking out. Honestly, I have no idea at the current moment. Frankly speaking, my face is well known. I can't keep myself hidden. It seems to me that I have no choice but to continue being a pirate. Rowan sighed, knowing that he brought this upon himself. Oh ho, so you are building a new crew? Karina said playfully. Then I want a spot there. Rowan scratched his head. Well, huh, why? Don't tell me that you are going to reject me. I can navigate, steal, and assassinate. Karina said as she pulled out her knife with a scary smile. Assassinate? Okay, you are in. Rowan gave her a thumbs up. Good thing for you. Got lucky here, having acquired the titles of Grimheart Rowan's first mate and the vice captain of the Demon Pirates. Yay. Karina pumped her fist up in an excitement. So what's the plan? I think we should stay and train a bit more. Stay in the East Blue? Nope. With mad treasure gone to Grand Line, the marine stationed here will be chasing after me for days and nights. Therefore Dash, Rowan held up his finger as he spoke. We will ensure to become hella strong before heading out to Grand Line ourselves. Rack up tons of fortunes, gain more crew members, and beat up anyone who blocks us. Aye aye, Captain. Karina replied with a cheeky grin as she saluted. All right. With all that said, our training begins today. For the next six months, Rowan and Karina trained themselves diligently. Rowan has focused on a further development of his basic strength, as he realized that he relies on his fruit ability too much. Since he has already developed an absurd physical strength, Rowan's training went next level. 20,000 push-ups with a huge boulder tied around his back. 20,000 sit-ups in a beach where ocean water gushes in and out. 20,000 squats while upside down, with his feet tied to a random ceiling. 80 kilometers full sprint run while three boulders are tied around his waist. Although such trainings were hard not to notice, Rowan was able to train secretly, thanks to the fact that many dangerous animals lived within the forests near the town, which prevented any commoners from heading inside. Karina, on the other hand, seemed to be practicing her knife skills. Rowan couldn't help but clap in awe when she did triple backflip while slashing a target tree 20 times consecutively in an instant. Her dexterity and reflex seemed to be very honed too. Rowan could not believe that she was the same girl as the one he saw a year ago. Now that six months have passed, Rowan having reached an age of 18 and 17 for Karina, they looked at the ship prepared in front of them. Naturally, it was a stolen ship, of course. One day, they saw the pirates coming into the town, demanding for money to the villagers like Arlong has done in the past. While they were busy, Rowan and Karina secretly snatched the ship away into a different coast and earned stupefied looks from the pirates as they realized the disappearance of their Lady Luck. Ugh. This ship surely looks ugly. Karina faked a vomit as she stared as the figurehead in disgust, which had a shining statue of a naked woman. Captain, can we remove that, please? Naturally, Rowan nodded. He didn't want his ship to look like a joke. All right. All tools are ready. He stared at the buckets of paints containing various colors. Hmm. We're going to color the sail clothes with brown. Gotta look cool. No. Brown on the sail. Are you seriously thinking that would look cool? Karina looked at Rowan in disbelief. Use something else, like red or blue. Looks more menacing and unique that way. What? But brown dash, no buts. Karina said resolutely. I am not seeing any brown on the sail, okay? Yes, ma'am. Rowan said dejectedly. For the next few days, they spent their days repainting Lady Luck. In the end, the product turned out quite decent. The sails were painted in red, while the body, including the masts, were painted in yellow and orange, along with a little bit of brown at Rowan's request. The ship looked simply flamboyant. Ooh, very fiery. I like it. Rowan and Karina nodded their heads in appreciation as they looked at the ship. What should the new name of this ship be? Karina asked to Rowan, who was contemplating. Hmm, something related to fire would match nicely. How about prominence? Rowan suggested, to which Karina agreed immediately. All right, prominence then. Rowan nodded before shouting ahead. Hey, Lady Luck, you heard that? 
Your name from now on is prominence. Believe it. Karina laughed before lifting up her brush. Well, we only have one last thing to do now. Jolly Roger. Well, whatever the end product may be, Rowan sighed. Please don't let it turn out like my last one. Seriously, a bald skull with a halo? That was the ugliest one I've ever seen. Hmm. They thought about it while drawing many possible candidates. How about this one? Karina said, pointing at the particular Jolly Roger, where the skull had red eyes and black hair. The overall structure, including the bones at the back, had blue hues around the edge. This one looks pretty unique, and anyone would recognize this Jolly Roger as you. Yeah, that one seems quite good. Rowan agreed to Karina's idea. Soon after, the Jolly Roger officially made its way on top of their sail. They stared at the finished ship in pride, the ship that they'll be riding on, standing tall majestically. The horrendous Lady Luck was long gone, and replaced by the cool-looking prominence. Rowan and Karina heard the voice all of a sudden, but couldn't see where it came from. Shrugging, they thought that they misheard. Compass, map, ruler, uh, food supplies, gas, what else are we missing? Rowan asked as he scratched his head. I think this should be all right, Rowan. Our destination is not that far away. Just a straight course to Baratai, Karina said. I doubt it. I mean, isn't Baratai a moving restaurant? How are we going to locate it? Look, it's not even shown on the map. Rowan sighed at Karina's optimism. Hmm, why don't we just go to a town instead? Won't it be easier that way? Nope. If you want a capable chef to join our crew, Baratai is the way. They are quite famous for their top-notch culinary art and battle prowess, which make them ideal for our requirements. Karina explained as she took the map from Rowan's hand. And in terms of locating it, you don't have to worry too much. They coated the exterior with white color, so it is quite easy to spot them from a distance due to the reflection of light. Although Rowan was skeptical, he had no choice but to listen to Karina. Unlike him, she has roamed around the East Blue since young, and acquired much information that he doesn't have. Additionally, she is their navigator of his ship. If she says so, it's probably true. For the past six months, Rowan and Karina have been adjusting and modifying their plan. In order to enter the Grand Line, they required at least three more crew members, a chef, to provide them a balanced diet on the sea, a doctor, to treat any injuries, diseases, or any other health abnormalities on the ship, and a shipwright, to ensure that the ship won't collapse during their sail. Karina shared the information regarding Baratai to Rowan, the floating restaurant full of capable chefs. They were hoping to recruit a formidable chef there, as well as enjoy the delicious meals that Baratai is famous for. All right, set sail, Rowan called out as he himself pulled on the rope. Although he was the captain, he had more strength than Karina. It was more suitable this way. As prominence left the shore, Rowan's eyes widened in realization. Wait, Karina, how much belly do we have? Hearing Rowan's inquiry, Karina quickly took out a stack of belly from her pocket before counting. Uh, around 50,000? Karina said dejectedly. My dream of having luxurious life. Ah, uh, what a pity. Hmm. Didn't you say that Barity's meals are quite expensive? As Rowan mentioned, Karina slouched even more. Yep. From what I recall, a full course meal costs over 10,000 belly at least. No, unless we get to convince a chef to join our crew right away, we will be broke in just a day there. This is conflicting. Uh, whatever. Rowan scratched his head before giving Karina a thumbs up. Well, if it turns out that we don't have enough, you just got to steal for us. Problem solved. Ah, uh, Rowan, you are a genius. Karina returned thumbs up to Rowan with a huge nod. I hope that we encounter lots of riches, Shishishi. After three days of sailing, they still didn't sight Baratai or any other floating building. All they had was a boring and uneventful sailing. Didn't you say that locating Baratai is easy? Rowan deadpanned. Hey, hey. Karina held out her tongue while lightly knocking her head. Sighing, Rowan looked around, trying to see where they were. HM? Is that a land that I'm seeing right now? Rowan squinted his eyes as he sighted an island. Karina opened a map and looked intently. Judging by my skill, the land in front of us should be Syrup Village. Syrup Village? Rowan tilted his head. So I'm assuming that they sell syrups? 
As the Rowan pirates approached closer to the island, a booming voice was heard suddenly. Mwahaha, I bid you my welcome to the base owned by me, the man of 30 million belly grim heart Rowan, the voice stated in a menacing manner. I currently have 100 billion henchmen situated here, waiting for my orders to strike. If you fear for your life, retreat immediately. At the same time, the pirate flags arose all around them, all revealing Rowan's old Jolly Roger of bald skull with Halo. Rowan and Karina sweat dropped at this. Ah, uh, don't tell me that you were the fake one all along. Karina faked a surprise as she exaggeratedly covered her mouth and pointed her finger at Rowan. Yes, yes. Rowan simply rolled his eyes. I will give you three seconds. The voice continued on. One, two, two and a half. Two and a half and a half's half. Why aren't you running away? The voice cried as prominence continued to approach the island. Fine. Take the assault of my henchmen. Attack. The voice screamed. And at the next moment, Rowan and Karina saw the rocks flying towards them. Not even bothering... Rowan simply punched each stone back to where it came from. Ow. Ouchie. Oof. The stones crashed into someone, and childlike screams were heard. Mission failed, mission failed. Retreat immediately. The voice screamed as the kids hurriedly ran away from the view. So, Captain, what shall we do now? Karina asked casually as Prominence safely landed on a shore. We still have enough food supplies left. This village seems relatively safe in comparison to other islands. Rowan shrugged. We didn't encounter any marine on our entry into this island, which means that the village must be secluded. Wait. Hmm. Doesn't this mean that this island will be perfect for identity washing? Literally what I was looking for a year ago. Rowan realized the irony. He found his dreamland only after giving up on it. Well, why don't we check out? Who knows? We might find some very rich and kind person who might be willing to donate by us. Rowan smirked, which earned heartfelt nods from Karina. They anchored prominence on the shore before landing on the sand. H halt there. Do not approach any further intruders. The same voice that they heard just moments ago returned. Looking up, Rowan found the boy with messy curly hair and a ridiculously long nose aiming his slingshot towards them. A slingshot? That seems impractical. Why slingshot when there literally exists a gun? Rowan tilted his head in confusion, but decided to keep his guard up just in case. Right, this is One Piece World. Anything is possible. Are we going to be seeing some robot transformations like Gundam 2? Ha. Huh. So you are grim heart, Rowan. Rowan said to the boy, Wow, haha, I am so scared. 30 million belly pirate pointing his slingshot at me. Karina was rolling on the ground, laughing so hard that she could barely breathe. T, that's right, you better be. I, the great USO Dash, Rowan, will end your life if you don't obey me. All right, do you know who I am? Rowan grinned, as he thought of the most ridiculous name he could think of. My name is Monkey D. Dragon. Mwahaha, I have the power of monkey on my right and dragon on my left. Grimheart, Rowan? He's nothing but a little wee-wee, playing in a bathtub. Aha, Monkey D. Dragon. That's a good one, all right. Karina's laugh intensified even further, as tears sipped out of her eyes. Just imagine the worst criminal. Dragon's full name being Monkey D. Dragon. Ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha, what kind of name is that? Usopp laughed, before shaking his head. I will say one more time. Leave now, Dash, before Usopp could continue. Rowan simply threw a simple punch out of irritation, backed by his bounce force, to the cliff on the right. Boom, his fist left a huge dent, and Usopp's jaw opened wide, out of fear. His brain processed the situation at an insane speed. The unnatural force with blunt sound, a well-known characteristic of the owner of Bounce Bounce Fruit, Grimheart Rowan. As Usopp came to a realization, he immediately ran away while screaming in fear. Well, that was easy. As Rowan and Karina followed the trail Usopp left while running away, they soon came in sight of a small village. So, this is Syrup Village? Rowan said while looking around. Reminds me of the Kokoyasi, just like his hometown. The Syrup Village had a peaceful atmosphere. The village was relatively quiet. The scenery was beautiful, surrounded by grass, trees, 
and blue sky above, with the wind gently blowing. The birds were singing, the flowers were blooming, and the kids were running around. Everyone, run! Pirates are here! In the middle of the village, they saw Usopp desperately crying out. He was shouting with three kids behind him. Yeah, they are here. We have to run away. Interestingly, no one seemed to be paying any attention to them. Some were shaking their heads in irritation, while some frowned in disapproval. TCH, this liar is at his work again, one villager said with a clear displease. Haven't you had enough? Grow up, kid. No, it's true this time. Please, you have to believe me. Usopp tried his best to persuade, but villagers heeded no attention to him. While looking around in attempt to convince the villagers, Usopp cited Rowan and Karina. Ah, uh, it's them! Everyone run away! Usopp screamed. Curious. People looked to where Usopp was pointed at. They saw Rowan, a black-haired youth with nothing striking out in particular, and Karina, a pretty girl with a light purple hair. Nothing about them seemed to resemble pirates. Looking at each other for a second, the duo smirked. Oh, I guess we are pirates now. Rowan shrugged. So, what do pirates do again? Karina held her finger up on her chin, as if she's trying to think hard. I heard that pirates aim to find one piece and become a pirate king like Gold Roger. Is that the case? If so, I am going to be the very best that no one ever was. Rowan pumped his fist up. Curiously gazing the duo's interactions, the villagers turned back to Usopp. What's part of them is pirate. Stop framing the innocents, you liar. They are just the outsiders visiting the village. Hey, stop acting. Usopp shouted as he stomped the ground with his foot in frustration. Usopp wished to tell the villagers that the person in front of them was the East Blue's worst pirate, with 30 million belly. However, he knew that revealing that information will induce panic within the villagers and worsen the situation. Don't worry, we are helping you here. By actually becoming the pirates, you are no longer a liar. Rowan grinned with flashing teeth while giving a thumbs up to Usopp. Seeing Usopp's reactions, Rowan couldn't help but troll him. Eventually, the situation toned down. Usopp seemed to have realized that the duo weren't trying to harm anybody, and the villagers dispersed to continue their daily affairs. Afterwards, Rowan and Karina found a small restaurant within the village, and seeing the cheap price, decided to give it a try. So, why are you guys here? Karina asked to three kids, peeking from the adjacent table. Boss told us to watch you guys, and tell him if you do anything suspicious. One kid said, before quickly covering his mouth. Oh. Laughing at their antics, Rowan asked, where is your boss? He went to Lady Kaya again, probably. Another kid answered half-heartedly. Oh, he's trying to woo a girl? Ha ha ha. Rowan burst out of laughter all of a sudden, remembering Sir Martinas from Orem. Karina also remembered the stuttering man in golden suit and grew a tick on her forehead. Lady Kaya is the richest person in the town, she has personal maids and butlers for herself, and she lives in the giant mansion. Third kid shouted in awe while holding his hands out wide, trying to emphasize the size of the mansion. And she is really pretty too. Ooh, rich you say? Karina stood up all of a sudden, her eyes blazing with fire. Big mansion, luxurious life. I must see it for myself. Led me there. She grabbed the kid who mentioned the mansion before running out. Wait, Karina, you didn't pay. Rowan shouted while sweating hard, his hand outstretched. However, she didn't hear his words and quickly disappeared from his sight. Uh... Rowan turned to the rest of the kids, staring at him in curiosity. Hey, how much you got? Wow, this place is quite big indeed. Karina remarked in awe as she faced the full glory of the mansion. This building clearly stood out from the rest of the village, where all construction seemed average with nothing special. They probably built this themselves. Just how much did they spend for this? Hiring workers ranging from common workers to skilled professionals. Preparing necessary materials. It should cost over 20 million bellies at least. I don't even get what you are talking about. The kid next to her said while picking his nose. Aren't you here to see boss and Lady Kaya? Nope, not really. Karina muttered without any interest while looking around the mansion with sparkling eyes. Suddenly, the main gate of the mansion opened slightly, and a butler with black suit, 
who has sharp features that is slightly toned down by his round glasses, walked out. I am sorry, but please leave without any further disturbance, the man said while pushing up his glasses. You are making a commotion here. Very, very disturbing for our lady Kaya. Karina and the kid were confused. All they did was chat at the outside of the mansion. What part of it was so disturbing? Didn't you say that your boss was here? How come? Oh dash, Karina realized as she saw the kid anxiously placing his index finger on his lips, trying to stop her from talking. Boss, Usopp, that filthy son of a pirate is here again. The butler frowned before going back in and shutting off the door. Subsequently, Rowan and two crying kids arrived. Oh wow, this is pretty big all right. Rowan said as he looked at the mansion, completely ignoring the sullen kids on the side. Used to be my dream goal. Become filthy rich in peaceful place and enjoy the privileges every day without having to work. The only thing missing here is having a waifu. Waifu, what's that? The kids said in confusion, something that every man of culture desires. Rowan replied seriously before loosening his expression. Well, it's not like it's possible anymore. I, I literally got 30 million on my head dash. Oops, 30 million. The kids cried in shock before running away in fear. Rowan simply watched a bit before shrugging. This island was free of Marines anyway. There wasn't much risk of having them know. Even if the Marines somehow hear the news and arrive, they will be long gone. You scared them away. Cool, Karina stated. Anyway, do you think I will be able to buy this mansion if I turn you into the Marines? While they were making random conversations, they heard the shout, Don't come back ever again! Usopp leapt out of the wall of the mansion. By pulling out a cable gadget from his pocket, he hooked the cable onto a tree branch and landed safely in front of Rowan and Karina. Usopp stood up and looked back at the mansion, while clenching his fist. Damn that Clahador! He turned around and saw the duo standing. Huh. Why are you guy here? Usopp still seemed scared of them, after figuring out Rowan's identity. Nothing much. Just came here to see the mansion. There's nothing else to do in this village, Rowan said with his hands in the pockets. At the same time, he began to think of a possible scenario. If we were to assume that Marines will arrive here, by somehow finding out our whereabouts, we need to have some safety measures just in case. Finishing his thought, Rowan spoke out. Hey, just wondering, do you have any idea as to which direction we should go to reach the Oregon Island? We lost compass and map on our way, so we kind of got no sense of direction here. Oregon Island? Wasn't that someone east from here? Usopp rubbed his head. No idea, but I can try to help you. Usopp really wanted these pirates gone from his village and was willing to do anything that didn't threaten his life. They were far too dangerous. All right, just asking. Rowan shrugged. Karina, on the other hand, gave Rowan up I know what you just did look. Although Syrup Village was the ideal village to live a peaceful life, however, there wasn't any value for the ones like Rowan and Karina to exploit. Contrary to their previous jokes, they were not some petty thieves or pirates that blatantly steal from the others. Therefore, they were thinking of leaving immediately, since they knew that the Marines were so bent on catching them. It would be so tiring once the Marines start tailing them. I guess we will head to that direction. Rowan pointed towards the direction opposite from their course and see how it goes. This is a goodbye, Long Nose. Who knows? We may see each other again in the future, with you being hailed as the Sniper King with those sling shots. After a very short-lived visit to Syrup Village, which was uneventful, Prominence has set sail again. Its course has been slightly adjusted to safely arrive at Baratai. Karina was very confident after missing it once. After sailing for a day, they sighted a red buoy floating on water. Approaching it, they saw that it had a word Baratai written on it, and was tied to a rope that extended very far. Alright, Baratai tends to move around within its boundary. Therefore, the restaurant places the buoys all around itself to ensure that sailors manage to find them. Few we managed to find it, Karina explained while pointing at the rope. All we got to do is to follow this rope all the way, nodding. Rowan turned the knob to face the direction of the rope. The ship changed the direction and continued its sail. Eventually, they noticed the floating building ship hybrid. 
The three-story building was mainly composed of green and red colored outer walls, with some white colors in between, which shined brightly as the light was reflected. There were many ships parked around, which indicated the popularity of this restaurant. Amazing. First time I've seen a ship like this. Rowan was impressed by its magnificence. How do you make a building float even? Well, we are finally here, Bartai. The one and only sea restaurant of the East Blue. Karina exclaimed excitedly. Although she knew pretty well about this restaurant due to the information she collected in the past, she never got to visit herself due to its expensive costs. Finding a space around Baratai to park, they used the anchor to hook prominence around the metal pole of Baratai tightly. Before getting off from the ship, you said that we have 50,000 belly, right? Rowan asked, in which Karina nodded as a reply. Ugh, I hope this goes well. They entered the restaurant through the door. As they stepped in, they immediately noticed how crowded the place was. Most of the tables were occupied, and the noises of the utensils clattering with the plates and people chattering filled the space. There was a waiter with black suit, situated right at the counter on the side. He noticed Rowan and Karina, and quickly responded, Hello, welcome to Baratai. Please sit on the table over here. We will bring menu boards swiftly. The waiter pointed his hands to the nearby table, guiding the duo to the spot. Immediately after, he placed two menu boards in front of them. Full course meal, 13,000 belly for each person. Is this the reality? Rowan muttered as he stared at the board. Bartai special salmon steak, 10,000 belly. Deep fried red lobster with garlic, 9.5 thousand belly. Rowan felt conflicted. Should he just YOLO and try the signature dishes, or embrace the harsh reality and order cheap ones? He took a long time to think about it, before deciding to choose the cheapest food, which is the bread sticks dipped in butter, costing 800 belly. I would like to order bread dash. I would like a full course meal for myself, Karina said joyously, earning a jaw drop from Rowan. And margarita for a drink, please. Got it. The waiter said as he wrote the orders down. As for the gentleman, what would you like? I, I would like to order a full course meal, and that's it. Rowan could not bring himself to order a beverage, which cost around thousand belly by itself. Please wait diligently. Your orders will be out soon. The waiter took the menu boards back and left their table. Rowan and Karina kept themselves seated, staring at each other while sweating hard and with widened eyes, having realized what they have just done. Two full course meals and a margarita. That's like 27,000 bellies for just one meal. Rowan said in frustration as he grabbed his hair. I remember binge eating in Orem City, which cost me only 5,000 bellies. In the past, I thought even that was a lot. But holy, 27,000. Ha. Huh. I couldn't resist myself. Everywhere I go, I hear about how good the foods from Baratai are. What's the point of coming here if we are going to have bread sticks dipped in butter. Karina slouched on her chair. Oh ho ho, I pity your soul. The rich flavor of steak, the crunchiness of the crusts that encase the soft flesh. Ah, uh, to think such heavenly dishes cannot be eaten, simply because one has no money. From the neighboring table, someone suddenly exclaimed. Turning around, Rowan met the person face to face, before immediately avoiding the gaze. What the... What came in Rowan's sight for a second was one of the most horrific scene he has ever come across. The strange person had a long, straight green hair all the way to one's waist. This person was wearing a blue dress and red high heels. However, the exposed legs were one of the most hairy ones he has ever seen, and most importantly the face. The size was humongous. It was at least twice the size of his head. With a square jaw, there was a masculine beard on the face. Such appearance scared Rowan all the way deep in the soul. I saw a titan a titan. Crouching down, Rowan hugged his knees, trying to erase the horrific scene from his memory. Um, just wondering, uh, ma'am, are you a crossdresser? Karina asked the person with a forced smile. You excuse me? Crossdresser? Said person shouted in anger, with a tick on his her forehead. I am an elite Nukuma Nairuko who had a glory of receiving Imperio Ivankov's blessings 25 years ago. Do not compare me to a mere cross-dresser, said Nairuko Humft, before turning back to Rowan. That being said, Hey handsome, Nairuko winked, 
who shuddered in an absolute fear. I like you, why don't we enjoy a cup of tea together? Rowan abruptly stood up, with a very pale face. No, just no. Please, this can't be real. Rowan screamed so hard that the other customers looked at him in a frown. Pee, please. I am just an average Joe. Handsome. I am the ugliest bastard in the world. H, haha, there is nothing interesting about me. Rowan said, as his legs shook so hard, that he was about to collapse at any moment. Eventually, his legs gave in, and he fell on his knees, with a terror apparent on his face. The food is Ari, a dash, a blonde with spiral eyebrows, wearing a black suit like the waiter, approached Rowan's table with plates of food, before abruptly stopping upon the sight of Nairako. How? How can this be? He almost dropped the plate, however, managed to lay it on Rowan's table before his legs gave in, which caused him to fall on his knees as well. Is this the real life? Is this the fantasy? The blonde man whispered as his hands shook violently. Kya, two men are proposing to me at the same time. Nairoko squealed at the sight of two men on their knees in front of her. No. They stood up with all their might at hearing this. P please, spare me. El look, this blondie next to me is much more appealing than a bulky guy like me. I smell a lot. Rowan pleaded desperately, which caused the blonde man's eyes to widen so hard that veins could be seen. No. No, 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 no. Look at him, my toothpick arms and legs. I shower once every year. This man next to me is the I-ideal man for you. The blonde man hurriedly shrieked. Meanwhile, while watching the scene, Karina was enjoying the sweet pea pesto crostini served by the blonde man, which was hors d'oeuvre or the first of the full course meal. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.